Jessica Tandy and Hume Cronin in The Marriage. With the conviction that marriage remains the most popular domestic arrangement between friendly people, NBC takes pleasure in presenting one of the most distinguished couples of the American theater, Jessica Tandy and Hume Cronin as Liz and Ben Marriott, bringing you the love and laughter of the marriage. I heard someone say once that childhood is a prison sentence with time off for good behavior. I suppose a lot of people feel like that. They remember the unhappiness, the fight to grow up, and they forget the warmth and good times completely. Thomas Wolfe wrote a novel called You Can't Go Home Again, but people keep trying. In our case, it all started with an ad in the Sunday Times. I showed it to Liz after the kids had gone to bed. Uh, two stir, cup cud, two ack, uh, gur, wool, proved rud. What is it, Ben? The Japanese naval code? It's a real estate ad. Oh. Two story Cape Cod on two acres. Oh. What's gur, wool? Sounds ferocious. <laughs> Garage and a well. <laughs> oh. You know, that ad's very interesting. A client came into the office today. That is interesting. And about time. Cut it out, dear. He wanted me to handle buying this house for him. You'll never guess where it is. Tanganyika? You're warm. Vermont. Oh, really? Cardiff, Vermont. Ben, Cardiff. How long is it since you were back there? Oh, 15 years. Well, I may have to go up there this weekend to search the title and complete the sale. Oh, uh, it's beautiful up there this time of year. There's probably snow. Probably. And skiing. That's right. And the mountains. Ben. It's all arranged, darling. We can leave on Friday. But the children... I called your mother this afternoon. She said she'd stay here over the weekend. Oh, Ben, it's like a vacation. Three whole days alone. Oh, um, is your client coming? No. Mr. Ramdan has a conference at Columbia. Ramdan? That's an unusual name. He's an Indian. Indian? A tomahawk Indian? No. No, a turban Indian. Oh. He came here with the U.N. Now he's teaching at Columbia. You should have seen him. A beard and a purple turban. Quite a sensation at the restaurant where we had lunch. Oh, Ben. What's the matter? A purple turban in Cardiff, Vermont. I wonder. Ben, there's a place on the left. Where? Oh, never mind. We passed it. Ben, I'm hungry. Well, we'll stop at the next place. You said that when we left New Haven. We are now approaching the Vermont border. What was wrong with that diner outside of Hartford? It wasn't clean. How could you tell? We went by it at 50 miles an hour. I can tell. It just didn't feel clean. Ben, there. Harry's Chop House. Where? On the left. I can't get over. There's a car passing me. Oh, Ben. What do you want me to do? Jump over him? I wonder if nylon seat covers are very nourishing. Darling, we'll stop at the next place no matter what. All right? It's all right. I've lost the will to survive. There's bound to be a place soon. Hmm. Ben, why does Mr. Ramdan want a house in Vermont? He's taking a sabbatical next year to write a book. After that, he'll use it in the summers. But why Vermont? Uh, I don't know. He saw the ad. It's far enough away from New York to be reasonable. Do you think Cardiff will be very reasonable? It's a good price. That isn't what I mean. You don't know Vermonters too well. A married one. Well, I'm not really a Vermonter, not anymore. But they're... They're very Vermont. What are you getting at? I've been thinking about the people from Cardiff. They haven't gotten over the border war with New York State, and that was in 1778. Come on, you're exaggerating. I can't imagine an Indian with a purple turban walking into Mr. Harris's grocery. Look, Mr. Ramdan is a very charming and intelligent man. He can get along anywhere. He's been all over the world. He hasn't been in Cardiff for months. Can't be any more dangerous than the Khyber Pass. I'm serious, Ben. You can tell when you're in Vermont. It's a subtle, insidious change in the atmosphere. What's the matter, Ben? Subtle, insidious change in the highway. We've crossed the state line into Vermont. Hello there. 
Hello? Is there anybody here? There must be. Lights are on in the gas pumps. Well, maybe he's out back. Hope so. I want to find out where we are. I know exactly where we are, Ben. The turn off the highway is by an old covered bridge. I remember it perfectly. You also remembered the shortcut around Brattleboro perfectly. It certainly went around Brattleboro and around and around several times. They changed the road. That isn't my fault. Well, I'd better go and look for somebody. Oh, cold. You don't mind it as much up here. It's dry cold. Five above zero is cold, wet or dry. Here comes somebody around the building. Hello? Uh, hello there. He didn't even look up. He can't hear you. His ear flaps are oh, down. He's seen us. Uh, hi there. Uh, uh, do you sell gas? Yep. Yeah. Good, we're down pretty low. Mm. Uh, would you mind filling the tank with premium? Yep. Yeah. You mean, you would mind? Uh-huh. Why? Ain't got no premium. Delivery truck broke down over to Jamaica. Well, why didn't you tell me? You didn't ask. Oh. Well, look, maybe you can help me. How do we get to Cardiff from here? Well, if, um, if I was going to Cardiff, I wouldn't start from here. No, you wouldn't. Uh, what happened to the old covered bridge by the way on that road? Burned down five years ago. You have a monitor? Well, I grew up in Cardiff. Oh. I could give you some regular gas. But you said you didn't have any. I don't. A premium. Why didn't you tell me that you had... Never mind, never mind. I know, I know. I, I didn't ask. Yeah. Uh, fill her up, you said. See what I mean? He got one look at your out-of-state license. Oh, that can't be it. Maybe he's got indigestion. Ben, that's what I'm telling you. I remember when I was a little girl how cold everything was. People just don't give themselves. I keep thinking of that purple turban. I thought you loved Vermont. I do. I... I mean, I love the traditions of individuality and, and the countryside. But you've just got to face reality. Check your oil? No, no, it's all right. But uh, I'm afraid the windshield's a little dirty. Yeah, sure is. You ought to clean it sometime. <laughs> well, I just thought I'd mention it. Uh, what do I owe you? 370 Should have filled up in Massachusetts. No tax. Ethan Allen Motel. Looks all right. Clean. Anything looks all right to me now. We can stay here and go out to the house in the morning. Come on. Oh. I'll get the bags later. Mm. The office seems to be down here. Close the door. Don't want to heat the whole valley. Oh, I'm sorry. It's in an address. Took Mr. Partridge off five years ago. My husband. I'm sorry. Oh, I don't grieve none now. Grief past a year is just a bad habit. Uh, we'd like a cabin for the night. Hmm. I figured that was it. Six dollars a night. Double with a shower. Well, that's fine. You, um, you got luggage? It's out in the car. Got to be careful. Man and wife? Of course. Ain't so much a course as you might think. Been married long? Oh, yes, 17 years. Hmm. Then you're not likely to be carrying a copy of the license? I'm afraid not. Well, I'll just have to chance it. Uh, we could show you pictures of our children. That don't signify. Anybody can carry pictures. Now, look here. Ben, There's no reason ben. To... It's perfectly all right, Mrs. Partridge, really. I don't have much choice. You cater to foreigners, and you got to expect this sort of thing. Madam, we're very tired. We drove all the way from New York City. New now... York City? Can't we have a bed? All right. Right this way. Cabins is plain. Nothing fancy. I hold with simple things. So did Mr. Partridge. Till just before he passed on. Sent for me that last night. Made me promise to get him a bronze casket with silver handles. Said he wasn't going to snap it around hell in no plain pine box. I can understand that. He wanted to make a lasting impression. Yeah. Oh, one thing more. Yes? Pay in advance. Ben? Hmm. Ben, you sleep? Yes. 
My mattress is lumpy. I think I've got Mr. Partridge's pine box. <laughs> ben. Mm-hmm. Can you imagine Mr. Ramdan meeting Mrs. Partridge? Please. Not just before I go to sleep. It won't work. I know it won't. Let's talk about it in the morning, darling. He just won't fit in. They won't accept him. Liz, I've been driving all day. Please. Can you imagine Mr. Ramdan at the Ethan Allen Motel? Yeah. He might do very well here. What do you mean? He comes from India. He might know how to sleep on a bed of nails. <laughs> There it is, Liz. Old house, but a very good buy. Dan, I remember this house. I think I do. We used to pass it when we drove over toward Bellows Falls. I remember the shutters. Come on, let's get in there before we freeze solid. You don't mind the cold here as much, Dan. I know. I know. It's dry. Come on. <laughs> What's the name of the owner? Jeremy Gale. Is he a lawyer? I think so. I bet I knew him. At least I used to see him at town meetings. I think he was a select man one year. So you drive up. Come on in. Thank you. Stamp your feet, Ben. I got a fire going inside. Oh, we need it. Mr. Marriott, I expect. That's right, sir. Uh, this is Mrs. Marriott. She comes from Cardiff. Oh? Moved away? Yes, I I live in New York now. Mm. Well, I suppose you had good reason. I remember you, though, Mr. Gale, from town meeting. You do? I don't remember you. Oh, that'd be 20 years ago. Elizabeth Walker. Walker. Ellen Walker's daughter? Yes. I knew your pa well. Real Vermonter. Well, now, Mr. Marriott, I suppose you're authorized to handle the sale. Yes. Yes, I've final authority. I suppose you wonder why I'm selling. Well, I'm getting old. How old would you say I was? Oh, I don't know, really. Uh, you're scared of guessing high and hurt my feelings. Well, I'm 72. That's too old to be stuck out on a dirt road in mud time. I understand, sir. I got no family. Since I retired from the law, I've been trying to farm on this piece. <laughs> Raised hogs so skinny I had to tie knots in their tails to keep them from squeezing out twixt the pickets in the pen. <laughs> you mean this isn't a productive farm? Uh, I got fields so steep... When I plowed them with a team of horses, one horse had to ride on the other. <laughs> had chickens so thin, it took two of them to cast a shadow. Do you expect to move into town, Mr. Gale? Yep. Renting a room across from the Methodist church. Come and go as I please. Independent as a hog on ice. I thought we'd drive over to the county seat this afternoon, Mr. Gale, and search the records and then finish up by evening. Uh, well, I ain't so sure. I beg your pardon? I ain't talked about terms or the mortgage I took out four, four years ago. And I got some thinking to do this morning, too. I tell you what, you come back this afternoon. But I'll uh, be ready to do business with you then. Well, all right. All right, well, we'll see you then, Mr. Gale. It was nice seeing you again, Mr. Gale. Find what you was looking for? Uh, what? When you moved away from Cardiff. Why is he stalling? Oh, he's got some reason. People up here don't do things in a hurry, especially selling land. He couldn't be trying to run up the price. Oh, Ben, Ben. What? Across the street is Aunt Hattie. Who's Aunt Hattie? Mine. I mean, not a real aunt, a courtesy aunt. She knew us when we were children. Oh, she's seen us. Are you sure? Aunt Hattie has an eye like an eagle. It used to be famous. She's coming over here. She's a sweet old lady, but she used to listen on the party line. Hello, Aunt Hattie. Isn't it exciting seeing you again? Elizabeth. Oh, Elizabeth Walker, it is you. I thought so. I could tell even with that hat. You're looking fine, Aunt Hattie. I keep busy. You're not looking well. I'm not? Mm-mm. Seated. Well, we can't all keep as well as you do. No, you can't. Not breathing that mixture of poison and soft coal they call air down in New York. You do live in New York now. Why, yes, I do. I heard that. Your mother wrote me. Said you were married to some city lawyer. I cried and cried when I read that. 
I told everybody it seemed such a shame. I remember you in high school. Showed such promise. Aunt Hattie, this is my husband, Ben Marriott. How do you do? Oh, we were just talking about you. I know. I heard. You ought to take care of Elizabeth. Oh, uh, well, haven't I? What about her teeth? Well, what about her teeth? You know, as long as you're up here, Elizabeth, you ought to drop into Dr. Hempstead's for a checkup. But I have a dentist in New York, Aunt Hattie. Well, I, uh, I wouldn't want to say a word against him, but... Uh... I have every confidence in my dentist, Aunt Hattie. All the same, it wouldn't hurt to make sure. Oh, and you could drop in at Galton and Pierce. They're having a sale on hats. Well, I got this hat at Hunt's Fifth Avenue. I thought as much. I went shopping down to Boston once. Didn't buy a thing. Why not? I can do just as well here in Cardiff without all that fancy folderol. Oh, Elizabeth, open your mouth. Hmm? Say, ah. Ah. Mm, I thought so. That New York air has your throat all inflamed. You drop in to Dr. Whitcomb and, and get it painted with Argerol. But I'm all right, really. And he may not have a fancy office on Park Avenue in New York, but Dr. Whitcomb brought you into the world right here in Cardiff. He never left it. Well, goodbye. Goodbye, Aunt Hattie. Goodbye, uh, Aunt Hattie. Hi, Mrs. Holcomb, thank you. Goodbye. <laughs> So furious. What's the matter? My dentist is the top man in the Columbia School of Dentistry. I mean, Dr. Hempstead is a very good dentist, too, but so is mine in New York. I know, dear. But she just assumes he can't be. Ben, don't you understand? Understand what? What they're all saying. They think I betrayed something because I moved away. Oh, now, Liz, it's I... It's true. I remember it so well. I think that's why I came down to New York to work after college. I was so cold, there wasn't any warmth here anyway. Now, don't get upset, Liz. It isn't true anyway. You can't blame a whole state for your individual feelings. Then it isn't individual. They don't approve of you because you're from New York, and they don't warm up to me because I left Cardiff. That's why Mr. Gale delayed the sale. I know it is. If they're prejudiced against me, how do you think they'll feel about an Indian with a beard? Mr. Gale's a lawyer. Lawyers aren't immune. Look, Liz, you grew up here. You're all tied up with it emotionally. You had a hard time breaking away. I can see this with a more objective viewpoint. You don't know them as well as I do. He'll make excuses. He won't sell them, Mr. Ramdan. I know he won't. Why shouldn't he? He won't. You'll see. Well, now, Mr. Marriott, I've been thinking. You have? I could sell this place to you just as easy as a eel going through a bucket of cream. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. For rights, I ought to move into town where that pill peddler Whitcomb can get to me easy. Well, that's fine. Then we can get down to business. But I ain't going to sell. You're not? No. No, I changed my mind. But but you advertised. We came all the way up here from New York. Yeah. Well, now, I'm sorry to inconvenience you, but things has changed. Oh. I, uh, I just don't want to sell. Oh, I see. Why not? Sentiment, I guess. Sentiment? Yeah. You see, this place was raised by my grandfather. It belonged to my father till he died. I, I just decided I didn't want somebody else living here. Not while I was alive. Well, I don't suppose there's anything else to say. No, I don't suppose there is. I think there is. Liz, no. No, but... Ben, let me alone. Liz, please. I'm just this, Ben. I, I can't stand it anymore. Mr. Gale, why? Why don't you sell? I listened and I tried to think of a reason. I, I, I didn't want to. I, I couldn't face the truth. You couldn't, eh? No, I think it's a shame. You don't want to sell because Mr. Ramdan is different, because he's foreign, because he wears a beard and a turban. Well, now, I didn't say that. No, no, you didn't. You were just hypocritical. You made excuses. You weren't even honest enough to admit you didn't want a man like that in Cardiff. Liz, please, you don't mean to I upset... do mean it. I felt it ever since we came here. I wanted to come back, but you made me glad I left. I, I don't ever want to come back. I, I'm ashamed. Well, now... I, I'm, I'm terribly sorry, Mr. Gale. I... 
However, I suppose I feel the same way. Yeah, well, before you go launching into an oration, too, maybe you folks didn't consider that I wasn't making excuses. Then why won't you sell? I said why. Maybe he's got lost in the shuffle, but you might recollect nobody told me this client of Mr. Marriott's was an Indian, with or without a beard. Oh. Oh. You know, around here, we may be old-fashioned and state proud. We don't make too much of a fuss over anything. We figure if our neighbor makes a darn fool of himself, why, that's his business. But he's got a right to it. Same way any fellow's got a right to live next door. He's got a right to wear whatever he pleases on his head. Inside his head, for that matter. And if I don't like it, why, no law says I got to listen. But, but I was sure... Yeah, yeah. Well, the way it stands now, you ain't likely to believe me, so, Mr. Marriott... You draw up the bill of sale. Well, you, you're you selling to Mr. Ramdan? Yeah. Miss Marriott, there's some things I take serious. Cooking, cigars, and the state of Vermont. Uh, I got something over here. Wrote down on a shirt cardboard over the desk here. Uh, listen to this. If the spirit of liberty should vanish in the United States and our institution should languish, it could all be restored by the generous store held by the people in this brave little state of Vermont. Uh, know who said that? No. No, I don't. Calvin Coolidge. He was a Vermonter. He said his piece, like the rest of us do. Just like the winter. Cold, but you don't mind it because it's dry. Uh, I suppose... I... I don't know what to say. In that case, don't say nothing. Mr. Gale. And you neither. Just don't go telling anybody you're ashamed of the place you was born. Anyway, I know what it is to be a foreigner myself. You do? Yeah. My grandfather come from New Hampshire. <laughs> it's like the Himalayas. You don't mind the cold, it's dry. (laughs) You'll enjoy that great lineup of musical entertainment Monday nights on NBC. Gordon McRae and famed Met star Mimi Benzel play the leading roles in the ever-popular Johann Strauss operetta, The Gypsy Baron, tomorrow night on the Railroad Hour. There's another half hour of great music classics when soprano Patrice Munsell appears as guest artist on The Voice of Firestone, with Howard Barlow conducting the Firestone Symphony. Later... Popular baritone Ezio Pinza offers a variety of Neapolitan melodies on tomorrow's brilliant Telephone Hour concert, while Donald Voorhees conducts the Bell Symphonic Orchestra. And you'll want to top off your evening of fine listening with more merry adventures at 79 Wistful Vista with that unpredictable and hilarious pair, Fibber McGee and Molly. All part of the great lineup of listening entertainment, Monday on NBC. This is the NBC Radio Network. The Jack Benny Program. The Lucky Strike Program, starring Van Johnson. Starring Jack Benny. (laughs) Starring Van Johnson, with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, Don Wilson. And yours truly, the pickle in the middle. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and a happy mustard to you, too. Uh, say, Don, why is it that every time we have a guest star, you always... Hey, Jackson, don't worry about that now. We're on the air and Mary isn't here yet. Mary? Mary isn't here yet? Gee, that's funny. <laughs> Dennis, what are you laughing at? You said it was funny. <laughs> Dennis, when I said it was funny, I meant it was hard to believe. You understand? Well... Sure you do, kid. When Jackson says something funny, it's hard to believe. (laughs) Phil, stop being on my side, will you? Can't understand Mary not being here. She's never been late before. Maybe she overslept. Yeah, over. (laughs) Well, I'm not going to wait any longer. I'll call her house.
Say, Mabel, what is it, gay punk wants now? The Benny's line is flashing. Yeah, I wonder what Saratoga punk wants now. <laughs> I'll find out. Yes, Mr. Benny. Miss Livingston? Yes, I'll call her home immediately. And he wants I should get him Mary Livingston. <laughs> oh. And say, Mabel, that reminds me. You know me, I hate to spread gossip. But several times lately, I've heard a rumor about Mr. Benny and Miss Livingston. Oh, don't be silly, Gertrude. He's old enough to be her father. <laughs> That's the rumor I heard. <laughs> No, Mabel, I can't figure out why Mary should be the light for today's program. They're having Van Johnson. Oh, boy, Van Johnson. Shangri-La with red hair. <laughs> yeah. Wouldn't it be wonderful if he were to step in here this minute and bow low to us and say, would you two charming and beautiful ladies do me the honor of going dancing with me tonight, babe? <laughs> yeah, but as far as I'm concerned, I'd just as soon go out with men like Jack Benny. Why? Well, when a man like Benny tries to kiss you and you tell him to stop and he stops, you don't feel so disappointed. <laughs> Gosh, I'll never forget the time Jack asked me to come up to his apartment to show me his etchings. And I went, why, Mabel Flap Savage. <laughs> Gosh, Grace, did you just see those etchings? 500 pictures of a man standing in a plantation holding up a big tobacco leaf. <laughs> well, once I went... Operator, operator, how about my number? I'm ringing it now. Hello? Is Miss Livingston there? What? She left the house two hours ago. She... Oh, for heaven's sake, I should have known. Goodbye. What's wrong, Jackson? What's wrong? Mary's late because she went to pick up Van Johnson in her car. I didn't tell her to do that. What girl's seeing him, I don't know. Well, Jack, you've got to admit that he is handsome. All right, so am I. After all, what's Van Johnson got that I haven't got? Yeah, what's Van Johnson got that Mr. Benny hasn't got? Quiet, Dennis. You, they're not afraid to answer. <laughs> hmm, Van Johnson. You know, Jack, I, I don't want to brag, but I've heard plenty of people comparing me to him. Don, the van they were comparing you with has furniture sticking out of the... <laughs> Anyway, I can't understand why all the girls rave so much about Van Johnson. All right, so he's young. Wait another ten years when he gets to be my age. <laughs> He'll see. Would you uh, mind repeating that, Jackson? I said, wait another ten years when Van Johnson gets to be my age. Well, I'm trying to figure out some way to answer that and keep it clean. <laughs> well, it can't be done, so forget it. Anyway, Mary and Van Johnson should be here by now. But then this is Sunday. There's probably a lot of traffic. <laughs> Am I driving too fast for you, Van? No, no, Mary. You're doing fine. <laughs> Gee, Mary, it sure is a nice drive from Beverly Hills to the studio. Yeah, I knew you'd enjoy the ride, so I took a little roundabout way. I'm glad you did. I've never seen San Diego before. <laughs> Would you like me to roll the window up, Mary? No, thanks. I like the wind. I was afraid it might blow your hair. You have such beautiful hair. Oh, Van, when you say things like that, I just get weak all over. <laughs> oh. Mary, look out! Gosh, didn't you see that bus? Yes, but I thought I could fly over it. I mean, fly around it. You better stop, Mary. The light just turned red. Oh, yes. The lights are red. The violets are blue. If we run out of gas, who cares? Woo! <laughs> I know, I know, Mary, but you'd better stop. You know, when I... Oh, excuse me, but I can't get a cab. Would you give me a lift as far as... Oh, no. It isn't. Oh! A 1946 Buick! <laughs> Why, 
What a stall. If she'd have gotten here, I'd have punched her right in the nose. <laughs> Say, Van, how do you happen to be a guest on Jack's program? Well, he made such an attractive offer, I couldn't turn it down. Jack made you an attractive offer? What was it? He said if I gave a good performance, he'd take me to see the outlaw. <laughs> Oh, but no kidding, Van. How much is he paying you to be his guest? Well, as a matter of fact, I forgot to discuss money with him. Uh-oh. What's the matter? The Screen Actors Guild has a country home just for actors who forgot to discuss money with Jack. <laughs> oh, I don't care about the money anyway. You know, Mary, even if I don't get a cent, it'll be worth it just being on the same program with you. Oh, Van, do you really... Oh, well. I can carry you the rest of the way. Here we are, Van, Studio B. Hello, Jack. Here's Van Johnson. Well, well, hello, Van. Hello, Jack. Yeah, I'm glad you finally got here. Mary, I'll talk to you later. I, uh, I hope you appreciate my sending Mary over to pick you up. What? Why, Jack, Fanny, of all... Mary. The... One more word out of you and the makeup, and he'll take that candle out of the window. <laughs> Man, I'd like you to meet our little group of thespians. Uh, this is Don Wilson. Well, he's the fattest little group of thespians I ever saw. <laughs> Pleased to meet you, Don. Well, I'm certainly glad to meet you, Van. I've always admired your work in pictures. Thank you. And this is my orchestra leader, uh, Phil Harris. Hello, Phil. Hiya, bub. What do you hear from the Hannah Rents Company? <laughs> So you're Van Johnson, huh? Uh-huh. Tell me, Johnson, what makes all them dames so crazy about you? Oh, I don't know. I guess it's just sort of a psychological phenomena. I'm dead. <laughs> Phil, please. Okay, okay. I'm pleased to meet you, Van. I've always admired your acting. Well, thank you, Phil. And I've always admired your music. Don't get sarcastic. <laughs> Look, Phil, Van was just trying to be nice. He really likes your music. Well, what does he like about it? All right, all right. Forget it. And Van, uh, Van, this is my uh, vocalist, Dennis Day. Glad to know you, Dennis. Should I swoon, Mr. Benny? No, no, Dennis, that's for girls. Uh, just say hello. Hello. And now, Van, I want to tell hey, you... Hey, Mr. That... Johnson. Yes, Dennis? My mother thinks you're wonderful in pictures. Well, thank you. She goes to see every picture you make. Well, I'm flattered. And now, Van, I want when to... When you tell... smile, she breaks out in big red blotches. <laughs> Dennis. When she saw you in Thrill of a Romance, she came home and burned her wedding dress. That's enough, Dennis. That's enough. And now, Van, My I want... father got so mad, he broke all the stays in her girdle. <laughs> yeah, girdle. Now, Van, as I started... It's awful. You might break up our home. Oh, for heaven's sake. Look, Dennis, it's time for your song. Now, go ahead. What a business. My home's being broken up, and I have to sing. Yes, yes. Now, go ahead. Come over here, Van. I want to tell you about the sketch we're going to do. I hope Marvin likes it. Make such 
such pretty speeches whenever we're apart. But when you're near, the words I choose refuse to leave my heart. Oh, say the sweetest phrases world has ever can't begin to tell you sung by Dennis Day. It's a wonderful song, Dennis, and you sang it beautifully. Yeah, and I can't understand it. My home's being broken up. It'll work out, kid. That really is a lovely song, and you did it beautifully. I, uh, I think it's a beautiful song, too, Jack, but I think the lyrics could be improved. Why, Don, what are you talking about? Those lyrics are simply wonderful. Oh, I know, Jack, but if I wrote the song, here's the way I would have done it. Uh, will you give me a little music, please, Phil? Okay, Dante. I can't begin to tell you what luckies mean to me. For deep down smoking pleasure, they are grand. Oh, they are grand. <laughs> so please, my friends, remember it's LSMFT. The finest, mildest smoke that's in the land. Oh, in the land. Gee, they're happy and my home's being broken up. Oh, <laughs> I make such pretty speeches about this cigarette. Uh, the, 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 the words I choose <laughs> would give you clues to what is your best bet. <laughs> they take the best tobacco the world has ever known. Oh, no. From way down south in Dixie, where it's grown. In Dixie, Like you and me are smoking LSMFT. Puff away, puff away, puff away. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute! <laughs> ho! Now get out of here. Hmm. I wonder where they got those gray uniforms. <laughs> And now, and now, ladies and gentlemen, oh, Van, Van, are you ready? You bet, Jack. Good. And now, ladies and gentlemen, in honor of our guest star, Van Johnson, who was recently seen in Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer's picture, Weekend at the Waldorf, for our feature attraction tonight, we will present our version of that same picture entitled, A Fortnight at the Acme Plaza. <laughs> Curtain. Music. The Acme Plaza Hotel Outwardly calm, but within A seething turmoil of emotion Where mystery meets intrigue Where intrigue meets romance Where romance meets drama Where drama meets grandpa <laughs> Yes, folks The Acme Plaza Hello, Acme Plaza, where the riff meets the raft. Sorry, Mr. Raft, Mr. Riff is out. <laughs> Acme Plaza, a good place to lose a weekend. There's a bottle in every chandelier. <laughs> One moment, I'll connect you. Hiya, cutie. Making any good connections lately? Well, well, if it isn't Sherlock Harris, the house detective. How does it feel to be a gumshoe? Now, hold it, baby. I may be a detective, but I ain't no gumshoe. You're not? No, not since I got this magnifying glass. I'm stepping over that stuff. <laughs> oh, say, uh, Sherlock, what's the latest dope on that character in room 417? You know, the one who's suspected of killing 23 wives. Well, I'm working on that. As soon as we find the bodies, we'll be able to pin it on him. Uh, find the bodies? Where do you think he's hiding them? I don't know, but that rug in his room is getting awful lumpy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, folks, the Acme Plaza. 
where mystery meets suspense, where suspense meets romance, where gravel Gertie meets B.O. Plenty. Hello, Gertie. <laughs> the Act Lee Plaza. Yes, babe, when Sherlock Harris is on a case, he always finds out what's going on and gets uh, his excuse man. Excuse me, uh, uh, room 310 is calling. That's the big business tycoon, the one that owns all the railroads. Oh, yeah. I understand he's kind of sweet on you. Hello? Hello, baby. You know who this is? Yes, you're that great, big, important business tycoon. That's me, the one and only Martindale Schnook. <laughs> uh, what can I do for you, Schnooky? I want to know if you'll go out with me tonight. Well? I'll give you anything your little heart desires. I'm rich. I own railroads, lots of railroads. The New York Central, Santa Fe, Baltimore, Ohio, the Southern Pacific, Union Pacific. I know, I know. You own all the railroads in the country. All except one, and they won't sell me that. I've got to have it. I've got to have it. Which railroad is that? The one that goes Bromoselsa, 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 Bromoselsa. <laughs> I'm crazy three ways. <laughs> well, Snooky, keep trying. I will. Goodbye. Gosh. The one and only Martindale Snook in love with me. I wonder... Operator, if... would you please get me room 212? My name is Van Johnson. Uh, one moment, please. I'm sorry, but 212 doesn't... What are you staring at? You. Gosh, but you're beautiful. What? You're wonderful. The minute I, saw, I first saw you, I knew you were the one for me. Look, would you please go out with me tonight? No, no, no. Go away. You're not my type. You're not... <laughs> Give me that again, will you? Would you please go out with me tonight? No, no. Go away. You're not my... Yep, that's what it says here. <laughs> yes, folks. The Acme Plaza, where boy meets girl. Where girl meets boy. Where I once had a routine, but it was cut out at rehearsal. <laughs> the Acme Plaza. <laughs> Look, honey, I'm lonesome, and you're, you're so beautiful. Lonesome? Didn't you ever have a girl? Only once, but I gave her up. Her eyes were like two limpid pools. Two limpid pools? And why did you give her up? Her nose looked like a diving board. <laughs> oh, oh, please forgive me. Please say that you'll go out with me. Well, I don't know. There's a big railroad man in this hotel who's in love with me. A railroad man? Well, don't you think it's time for a switch? Ah! <laughs> oh, Johnson, you've got a million freckles and a joke under every one of them. What? Oh, forgive me. When I'm excited, I, I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> but I do know that I, I want to marry you. Say that you'll be mine. I'm sorry, but I'll have to think it over. Think it over, think it over. That's what they all say. What's wrong with me? Why can't I get a girl? Why can't I... Uh, pardon me, operator. Uh, would you please ring Miss Lana Turner's room? Lana Turner? Yes, sir. Uh, take it on phone number three, please. Thank you. Hello, Lana? This is Van Jackson. <laughs> yes, yes, I know my voice sounds like honey dripping into your ear, but you always have to keep telling me that. What? No, I'm sorry, I can't take you out tonight. I know I promised you this afternoon, but I can't make it. Oh, now, Lana, don't feel that way. What? Lana, put down that gun. You will get over it. <laughs> I don't care if it is a water pistol. You'll drown yourself. <laughs> well, all right, call me next week. And stop sending me orchids. My room is full of them. Goodbye. Thank you, operator. Hey, imagine turning down a date with Lana Turner. Who is he? Uh, that's Van Jackson, the glamour boy. Gosh, I wish I could be like that. Well, you can't accomplish it overnight. He's been working on it for over 50 years. <laughs> well, do you think it might help me if I went over and talked to him? Yeah, sure. What have you got to lose? Uh, I beg your pardon, Mr. Jackson. Do you mind if I ask a favor of you? Why, no, no, no. Go right ahead. Well, I was standing over there by the switchboard, and I heard you talking to Lana Turner. Oh, good, good. I thought maybe I wasn't talking loud enough. <laughs> now, what's, uh, what's on your mind, son? Uh, I'm in love with that telephone operator, and I just can't get anywhere. I don't know what's the matter with me, but girls just don't seem to like me. They don't? No. Well, I can understand that, kid. Look at your face. You have too many freckles. Too many? Yes. 
Now, my complexion is perfectly clear. And look at your eyes. They have no expression. They haven't? No. Now, if you'll notice, my eyes sparkle. Yes, they do. And look at your hair. My hair? Yes. Now, take mine. Thanks. Put that back! <laughs> Turn it around, I look silly and bang. <laughs> now listen, kid. The trouble with you is that you probably haven't got the right approach. You're too timid. If you want to take that telephone operator out tonight, you can't walk over and say, May I have a date? You got to go over there and say, Listen, babe, you're going out with me tonight, see? We're going to the Macombo, and you're going to pay the... No, not the first time. <laughs> now go ahead, walk over there and do as I tell you I'll be right behind you Gee, thanks, Mr. Jackson Now listen, babe Huh? I've been strolling around here long enough You're going out with me tonight and that settles it What? I said you're going out with me tonight and we're going to the Macombo Gee, the Macombo Then can we go to the other places too? Other places? You say you're not hmm. satisfied? You say you want more? Tell you what I'm gonna do Tell you what I'm gonna do Gonna let you in on something hot You'll be sure to win on what I've got Looky, looky, looky You'll be fully guaranteed Never to be lonely Tell you what I'm gonna do Gonna lay it gently on the line Say it sentimentally Please be mine Hurry, hurry, hurry Who can tell where this will lead? Baby, if you only knew Here's a chance for a solid thing Latch on, don't throw it away Here's a heart, and I'll make delivery today You say you're not satisfied, tell you what I'm gonna do Gonna do the things you want me to Be the one who brings the skies of blue Nothing will be too good every day A no good deed Tell you what I'm gonna do Gonna fall in love with you Tell you what I'm gonna do Gonna pick the shirts and ties you wear Gonna change the way you part your hair Under my direction you can be perfection soon Pardon me for living Tell you what I'm gonna do Gonna be the one who loves you most Be the one who keeps me warm as cold Nothing will be too good Every day a new good deal Tell you what I'm gonna do Gonna fall in love Gonna fall in love Gonna fall in love with you Yes, folks, everything happens at the Acme Plaza. You say you're not satisfied? You say you didn't like our play? You say you want more entertainment? Tell you what I'm going to do. Here's Mr. F.E. Boone of Lexington, Kentucky. <laughs> Take it away, F.E. <laughs> American. In a cigarette, it's the tobacco that counts. And Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, during this past week, our nation has been saluting Boys Club of America, the purpose of which is the social, physical, educational, vocational, and character development of boys from 8 to 20 years of age. Now, more than ever, we should look forward to building boys into better men, which is the motive of the Boys Clubs of America. There are roughly a quarter of a million members and many prominent men and women serve on the board of directors. We can all help promote this fine organization by getting in touch with our local boys club of America. They need us. We need them. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the song I'm Gonna Fall in Love with You was written by Johnny Green and Ralph Blaine and sung for the first time by Mary and Van Johnson. Van Johnson appeared here tonight through the courtesy of MGM, producers of A.J. Cronin's The Green Years. Say, Van. Yeah, Jack? 
I meant to ask you, this picture, the green years, how, how come that you're, you're not in that one? Well, the leading man called for a man old enough to be my father. Oh. Say, Jack, now that I think about it... Oh, go have... count your freckles. <laughs> Good night. The National Broadcasting Company. Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Claudette Colbert and Fred McMurray in His Girl Friday with Jack Carson. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. And that goes double for the ladies and gentlemen of the press because we feel a slight pang of regret for what we're about to do to them. It's been rumored that they don't ordinarily behave, as our play tonight would indicate. But we gaily beg their indulgence on the ground that His Girl Friday is an exceptional case. Tonight we present a lady of the press in the engaging person of Claudette Colbert and a gentleman of the same profession played by Fred McMurray, a perfect team for the hectic happenings of the next hour. And right now I'm going to give away a trade secret about this comedy. Most of you will remember a famous play about the newspaper business called... The front page. Well, any resemblance between that play and His Girl Friday is no coincidence, but entirely intentional. This Columbia screen hit, produced by Harry Cohn and Sam Briskin, was based on the front page, but certain differences make it practically a new story. Hildy Johnson, the hero, used to be a man. Tonight, Hildy is a lady, a very charming lady, Claudette Colbert. Walter Burns, the autocrat of the editorial rooms, is just as autocratic as ever, with Fred McMurray in the part. And between rapid adventures with an escaped maniac, a crooked sheriff, a last-minute reprieve, and a kidnapped mother-in-law, they even managed to find time for romance. I'm sure every woman will agree that the silent partner of romance is loveliness. And that's why so many millions of women choose Lux Toilet Soap. They know that Lux Toilet Soap is a very active partner of loveliness. Now a quick signal to the switchboard. The footlights brighten and the curtain rises on the first act of His Girl Friday, starring Claudette Colbert as Hildy Johnson and Fred McMurray as Walter Burns, with Jack Carson as Bruce Baldwin. <laughs> when a young and charming ex-wife drops in to see her ex-husband, there usually arises what is known as a delicate situation, particularly when she brings along her new fiancé. But Hildy Johnson, our ex-wife, was never fazed by a delicate situation. Bruce Baldwin, the new fiancé, was not consulted in the matter, and Walter Burns, the ex-husband and managing editor of the Morning Post, doesn't know about it yet. He's in his office as Hildy barges cheerfully through the city room, her fiancé a few steps to the rear. Ruth, hello, Maisie. Hildy, Hildy Johnson. How are you? Hey, what are you doing here? You coming back to work, Hildy? No, just visiting. This is my fiancé, Mr. Baldwin. Oh, hello. Pleased to meet you, I'm sure. Tell me, is the Lord of the Universe in? Mr. Burns? Yes, he's in, in a bad humor. <laughs> is that unusual? He's got Louis Peluso in there with him. You want to be announced, Hildy? No, 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 I'll blow my own horn. Bruce, he's in, so you'd better wait here. I'll be back in ten minutes. Even ten minutes is a long time to be away from you. What did you say? Oh, I... I'll go on, Bruce. Well, I, I said even ten minutes is a long time to be away from you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I heard you the first time. I like it. That's why I have to say it again. You know, I can stand being spoiled a little. The gentleman I'm going in to see did very little spoiling. I'd like to spoil him just once. 
Are you sure you don't want me to go in with you? No, no, I can handle it. You just keep your eye on that door, see? Walter Burns, managing editor. I'll be coming out in ten minutes. Well, if it gets rough, remember I'm here. <laughs> I'll come running, partner. Goodbye, darling. Goodbye. Okay, call me right back. Morning, Mr. Burns. Hello, Louie. Hey, boss, your ex-wife is here. Hello. Hello, I can't hear you. How have you been, Mr. Peluso? How's the big slot machine king? Oh, I ain't doing that no more. I'm retired, know what I mean? No. I'm a newspaper man now, waiting for Mr. Burns. Yeah. Okay. Okay, goodbye. Hildy! Hello, Hildy. Hello, Walter. Say, this is great. Outside, Louie. Sure. Gee, honey, you look swell. I... Walter, I, I've got to see you right away. No, not now, Duffy. But listen. No, not now, I'm busy. Walter, I thought you ought to know that the governor did not sign that reprieve. What? And tomorrow morning, Earl Williams dies and makes a sucker out of us. What are you going to do? Uh, excuse me, Hildy. Oh, sure. Get the governor on the phone, Duffy. I can't. He's out fishing. Well, get him anyhow. Tell him if he reprieves Earl Williams, we'll support him for senator. What? Tell him the morning post will be behind him, hook, line, and sinker. But you can't do that. Why not? Because we've been against him for six years. All right. After we get the reprieve, we'll be against him again. But, Walter. Come on, Duffy, get going. All right, all right. Well, Walter, I see you're still at it. Yeah, first time I ever double-crossed the governor. Hildy, you look prettier than ever. <laughs> well, thanks. You mind if I sit down? Well, there's a lamp burning in the window for you, honey. I jumped out of that window a long time ago. Yeah. How long since we've seen each other? Well, let's see. I was in Reno six weeks, and then Bermuda, oh, about four months, I guess. Seems like yesterday to me. Mm. Maybe it was yesterday, Hildy. Been seeing me in your dreams? No, no. Mama doesn't dream about you anymore, Walter. You wouldn't know the old girl now. Oh, yes, I would. I'd know you any time, any place, anywhere. Any place, anywhere. anywhere. Yes, you're repeating yourself, honey. That's the speech you made the night you proposed. Yeah, I noticed you still remember it. Of course I remember it. If I hadn't remembered it, I wouldn't have divorced you. Yeah. You know, Hildy, I sort of wish you hadn't done that. Done what? Divorce me. Makes a fellow lose all faith in himself. Gives him a feeling he isn't wanted. Now, look, Junior, that's what divorces are for. Oh, nonsense. You've got an old-fashioned idea that divorces are something that lasts forever. But divorces don't mean a thing nowadays, Hildy. Just a few words mumbled over you by a judge. We've got something between us nothing can change. I suppose you're right in a way. Sure, I'm right. I am fond of you, you know. Had a girl. I often wish you weren't such a stinker. It's a nice thing to say. Why did you promise not to fight the divorce and then do everything you could to gum up the whole world? Oh, Hildy, I only acted like any husband that didn't want to see his home broken up. What home? What home? Don't you remember the home I promised you? Sure I do. That's the one we were to have right after our honeymoon. Yes, the honeymoon. Now, was that my fault? Did I know the coal mine was going to cave in? I intended to be with you on our honeymoon, Hildy. Honest, I did. All I know is that instead of two weeks in Atlantic City with my bridegroom, I spent two weeks in a coal mine with John Krupski. You don't deny that, do you? Deny it? I'm proud of it. We beat the whole country on that story. Well, suppose we did. That isn't what I got married for. Oh, Hildy, what's the use of fighting? I'll tell you what. You come back to work in the paper, and if we find we can't get along in a friendly way, we'll get married again. What? Sure. I haven't got any hard feelings. <laughs> Walter, you're wonderful in a loathsome sort of way. You mean you won't come back to work in the paper? You're right, Mr. Burns, the first time today. You got a better offer, huh? You bet I've got a better offer. All right, go on, take it. Work for somebody else. That's the gratitude I get. What were you when you came here five years ago? A little college girl from a school of journalism. I took a little doll-faced punk oh, and... Oh, you wouldn't have taken me if I hadn't been doll-faced. Well, what of it? I made a great reporter out of you. It just didn't work out, was Well, it, it would have worked if you'd been satisfied with just being editor and reporter. But not you. You had to marry me and spoil everything. I suppose I proposed to you. Well, you practically did. Made Google eyes at me for two years. Why, you... Hey, put down that inkwell. Ah, Hilda, you're losing your eyes. Used to be able to pitch better than that. Hello? Hello, Walter. This is Duffy again. Oh, Oh, hello, Sweeney. What can I do for you? Now, wait a minute. I'm not Sweeney. I'm Duffy. Sweeney, you can't do that to me. Not today of all days. What's the matter with you? Are you loony? This is Duffy. Now, listen, Sweeney. This is no time Walter, to... Walter, I have all to. All right, then. If you have to, you have to, I guess. He had to, huh? How do you like that? Everything happens to me. What's the matter? Sweeney, the only man in the paper that can write and he has to pick today to have a baby. Well, he didn't do it on purpose, did he? I don't care whether he did or not. He's supposed to cover the Earl Williams case, and where is he? Walking up and down in a hospital. Is there no sense of honor in this country? Haven't you got anybody else? No, there's nobody else in the paper who can write. This will break me and I... Hildy. Uh-uh. Hildy, you've got to help no, me. No, sir. Don't let me down in my darkest hour. It'll bring us together again, Hildy, like we used oh, to be. Oh, scram, Sengali. Well, if you won't do it for love, how about money? I'll, I'll raise you 25 bucks a week. Will you listen to me, you great big bumble-headed baboon? Do you see this on my finger? Do you know what it is? It's an engagement ring. Engagement ring? No. Well, I tried to tell you right away, but you would start reminiscing... I'm getting married, Walter, and I'm also getting as far away from the newspaper business as I can get. Huh? I'm through. No, no, Hildy. 
You can get married all you want, but you can't quit the newspaper business. No, why not? It'd kill you. You're a newspaper man. You're a journalist, Hildy. A journalist? Now, what does that mean? Peeking through keyholes, chasing after fire engines, stealing pictures off old ladies. Oh, I know all about reporters, Walter. A lot of Daffy Budinskis running around without a nickel in their pockets. And for what? Just so... Oh. Oh, well, what's the use? You wouldn't know what it means to me anyway. I want to be respectable and live a halfway normal life. Well, the point is, I'm through. Where'd you meet this man? Bermuda. Rich, huh? No, he's not what you'd call rich. What's his line? He's in the insurance business. The insurance business? Well, that's a good, honest business, isn't it? Oh, sure. It's also adventurous and romantic. Now, listen, Hildy, I can't picture you being surrounded by policy. I can, and what's more, I like it. Besides, he forgets the office when he's with me. He doesn't treat me like an animal either, Walter. He treats me like a woman. Oh, he does, does Mm -hmm. he? How'd I treat you, like a water buffalo? I don't know about water buffaloes, but I know about him. Oh, he's kind and sweet, and he's considerate. He he wants a home and children. Sounds more like a guy I ought to marry. What's his name? (laughs) Baldwin. Bruce Baldwin. 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 I knew a Baldwin once, a horse thief in Mississippi. Couldn't be the same fella, could it? You're not talking about the man I'm marrying tomorrow. Tomorrow? Soon as that, huh? Well, now... Uh, Well, at last I got out when I came up here to tell you. I guess there isn't any more to the story. So long, Walter. Oh, no, wait a minute, Hildy. You kind of took the wind out of my sail. Look, honey, I I just want to wish you everything I couldn't give you. Thank you, Walter. I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to meet him. I'm more or less particular about who my wife marries. Or is he? Oh, he's right on the job waiting for me outside. Oh, well, you mind if I meet him? (laughs) Of course not. Well, then, come on. Let's see this paragon. Is he as good as you say? He's better. Well, then what does he want with you? (laughs) Well, now you got me. (laughs) Bruce! Bruce, dear. Yes, Hildy? Bruce, I want you to meet Mr. Byrne. Mr. Baldwin, my fiancé. Oh, how do you do, Mr. Byrne? Oh, go on, it's a gag. Huh? It's a gag. You're not Bruce Baldwin. Walter, what are you trying to Really, do? is he? Certainly, Bruce Baldwin. Oh, well, I, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Baldwin. Hilda, you led me to believe you were marrying a much older man. Oh, really? And what did I say that oh, led you to... Oh, don't worry about it. I realize you didn't mean older in years. Oh. Do you always carry an umbrella, Bruce? Yeah, well, <laughs> it looked a little cloudy this morning. That's right, it did. Rubbers, too, I hope. Uh-huh. That's fine. Man ought to be prepared for any emergency. Bruce, I think we'd better be running along. Yeah, we better get going. Where are we going? Oh, I'm taking you two to lunch. Uh, Hilly, didn't you tell him? No, she didn't. You're wasting your time, Walter. It won't do a bit of good. Oh, no, glad to do it. Glad to... Well, well, well. So you two are going to get married, huh? You're getting a great girl, Bruce. I realize that. Yes, and you're getting something else, too, Bruce. You're getting a great newspaper man. No orchids, Walter. One of the best I ever knew. Sorry to see you go, Hildy. Darn sorry. <laughs> I'd like to believe you meant that. I do mean it. But I know what you want, Hildy. You want a home. Well, I'll certainly try to give her one. I know you will, Bruce. Where are you going to live? Albany. Albany, eh? Got a family there, Bruce? Oh, just my mother. Oh, your mother, huh? <laughs> you going to live with her? Well, just for the first year. Mm, that'll be nice. A home with mother. <laughs> In Albany, too. Oh, hey, Hilda, what would you kick me for? I'm sorry, Walter, my foot must have slipped. Oh, okay. Well, uh, let's have a drink, shall we? What do you say? Hey, guys. Oh, no, not for me. I've got to buy the tickets yet and check the baggage. We're taking the sleeper for Albany. Oh, are you leaving today? Uh Uh-huh, 4 (laughs) o'clock. We're getting married tomorrow. Well, let me get this straight. You mean you're taking the sleeper today and then getting married tomorrow? Oh, well, it's not like that. Well, what is it like? Oh, poor Walter. He'll toss and turn all night, Bruce. You'd better tell him Mother's coming along, too. Mother? Well, your mother kicked the bucket three years ago. Oh, no, no, my mother. My mother. Oh, your mother. Yes. Well, that relieves my mind. No, it was cruel to let you suffer that way, wasn't it? Isn't Walter sweet, Bruce? Always wanting to protect me. Well, I, I admit I wasn't much of a husband, but you can always count on me. Oh, Mr. Burns. Yeah, yeah, guys. You want on the phone. No, thanks. Excuse me, will you? I'll be right back. Not at all. Don't be long. We've got to leave. Right away. Hello? Hello, Walter. This is Duffy. Oh, Duffy, I'm glad you called. About that lead. No, forget it. Listen. Is there any way we could stop the 4 o'clock train to Albany from leaving town? Sure. We could dynamite it. Oh, okay, never mind. Now, get this. Get hold of Sweeney and send him out of town on a two-weeks vacation right away. But, Walter, he's covering the Williams hanging. Keep your shirt on. Hilly's coming back in the paper. She is? Yeah, she doesn't know it yet, but she's staying. And listen, tell Louie to stick around the office. I may need him. In the meantime, I kind of wish you'd hurry up. You know, Hilly, he's not such a bad fellow. No, he should make some girl really happy. Flat happy. <laughs> I sort of like him. He's got a lot of charm. Yeah, he comes by it naturally. His grandfather was a snake. Shh. <laughs> Here he is. Say, he looks all upset. Uh, sorry, folks. Something wrong, Walter? Yeah, bad business. What's the matter? Uh, the Earl Williams case. Oh, yes, I've been reading about that. What's the lowdown? Uh, simple, honey. The poor little dope lost his job. Went nuts and shot a cop who was coming after him to quiet him down, and 
Now they're going to hang him tomorrow. Well, if he was out of his mind when he did it, why doesn't the state just put him away? Because there happens to be an election coming up in a couple of days. And nothing brings in the votes like a good old-fashioned hanging. Well, I should think you could show the man wasn't responsible. No, that's not so easy. Well, maybe it's not so hard either. What do you mean, Hilly? Well, don't they have to have another expert examine him before they hang him? Oh, sure. A guy named Egelhoff is going to do it. Why? Well, look, Walter. You get an interview with Earl Williams. Yeah? Print Egelhoff's statement. Yeah? And right alongside it, you know, double column, you run your interview. Alienist says he's sane. Interview shows he's goofy. Hildy, you could do it. You could save that poor devil's life. No, you could... no, no. Oh, that's right. You're going away. I forgot. Well, how long would the interview take? Oh, only an hour for the interview and another hour to write it. That's all. Well, Hildy, we could take the six o'clock train if it would save a man's life. Well, sure. No. Walter, if you want to save Earl Williams' life, you can just interview him yourself. Or else get Sweeney. He's the best man you've got on that paper for stuff, uh, poor Sweeney. Duffy just told me. His wife finally had twins. Isn't that terrible? So Sweeney goes out to celebrate and falls down a flight of steps. Sweeney has twins, so Earl Williams hangs tomorrow. Oh, now, Walter, it isn't as bad as that. Oh, look, Bruce, argue with her, will you? Argue with her. Otherwise, you're going on a honeymoon with blood on your hands. How can you have any happiness after that? All through the years, you remember that a man went to the gallows because she was too selfish to wait two hours. Wait a minute. Wait a... What's the matter? I just remembered. Sweeney only got married four months ago. (laughs) You win. Then Mrs. Sweeney didn't have twins? No, honey. The twins were Walter's. No, it was nothing. Here, we'll start all over again. I'll offer you two a business proposition. Bruce, I understand you're in the insurance game. Don't listen to him, Bruce. I know all his tricks from way back. Hilly, I'm talking to him. Now, look, Bruce. You persuade Hilly to do this story, and you can write a nice, fat policy for me. What do you say? Oh, no, Mr. Burns. I won't use my wife for business purposes. Wait a minute. How big a policy, Walter? Oh, 25000 What? 50000 100 Bruce, what's the commission on a $100,000 policy? Well, around $1,000. So what's wrong with $1,000? How long would it take to get him examined? Well, I could get a company doctor here in 20 minutes. Okay, I'll get the story. Now you're talking. You keep out of this. Bruce, take him down to the office and see if they'll allow anything on that carcass of his. Say, I'm better now than I ever was. That's nothing to brag about. And look, Bruce, after you get the check, you phone me. I'll be in the press room of the criminal court building. Oh, Walter. Yeah? You, I think you'd better make that a certified check. What do you think I am, a crook? Yes. All right, it'll be certified. Want my fingerprints? No, thanks. I've still got those. Bruce, how much money have you got on you? Well, you know everything we have. Five hundred dollars. Well, give me the five hundred. But I have to get the tickets. No, I'll buy the tickets. But, Hildy, I... Oh, really, darling, I know what I'm doing. He'd get you in a crap game. Now, please. Well, all right. Here you are. Thanks. And when you've finished examining this imperfect specimen, remember now, call me. Press room, criminal court building. I will. Be careful now. Never mind me. Watch out for yourself. You're in bad company. Hello. Hello, press room. McHugh speaking. Hey, who is this? Oh, the sheriff. Oh, hiya, sheriff. Oh, wait a minute, I'll ask you. Hey. Hey. Huh? Sheriff Hartwell says we're making too much noise. Tell him to go soak his head. <laughs> go soak your head, Sheriff. I got three aces. Hiya, boys. Hey, look, oh, it's Hildy Hi, 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 Eddie. Hi, Joe. Hi, yeah. Hildy. Glad to see you. Glad to see you. Coming back to work, Hildy? No, no. This is just a farewell appearance. I'm going into business for myself. What doing? I'm getting married tomorrow. Oh, no. <laughs> you're not fooling us, are you, Hildy? No, on the level. Look what I've got right here. Three tickets for Albany on the six o'clock train tonight. What do you mean, three tickets? Me and my beau and hats off, boys. His sweet darling mom. What? Your mother-in-law? What kind of marriage is that? No, it's going to be all right. I'm going to settle down. I'm through with the newspaper business. Oh, sure. Hey, can you picture Hildy singing lullabies and hanging out the dieties? And swapping lies over the back fence? Sour grapes, boys. She'll be back as soon as she gets tired beating rugs. You, too bad you can't stick around to Lamara, Hildy. You're missing a nice hanging. Say, I have to do a yarn on William. Did he know what he was doing when he fired that gun? Yes, ask us, no. If you ask the state alienist, the answer is yes. Press room. Huh? Oh? Oh, yeah, she's here. Is that for me? Yes. Here, hand it over. Hello? Hello, Hildy. Oh, yes, darling. Did you get the check from Walter? Sure, certified and everything. I got it right here in my pocket. In your pocket? That's fine. Fu- uh-huh. Uh, now, wait a minute. Maybe it isn't so fine. Where are you? I'm in Mr. Burns' office. Well, now, look, Bruce. I don't want you to carry that check around in your pocket. Hildy, it's all right. Check is made out to the company. Nobody can cash it, and anyway, I wouldn't lose a check like that. It means too much to us. Don't worry, Hildy. Now, look, Bruce. Do what I say, will you? I don't want you to carry that check in your pocket, please. Yeah, but I think it's all right. There's an old newspaper superstition that the first big check you get, you put in the lining of your hat, see? It brings you luck. Well, Hildy, that's silly. I know, darling, but do it for me. Oh, all right. And look, tell Walter I'm going right over to Earl Williams' cell to get the interview. I'll phone it in as soon as I can. I'll tell him. Goodbye, dear. Goodbye. 
Everything all right, Bruce? Oh, uh, yes, Hildy said to tell you she'd get right to work. Oh, fine. Well, I must be going now. Thanks again, Mr. Burns. Oh, don't mention it, Bruce. Don't mention it. I'd do anything for you and Hildy. Yes, I'm beginning to realize that. Well, goodbye, Mr. Burns. Goodbye, Bruce. Oh, and don't forget your umbrella. Might rain, you know. Huh? Oh, thanks. Well, goodbye. Goodbye. Hey, Louie. Louie, come in here. Yeah, boss. Come here. Listen, did you see the guy that just left here? That dope? Yeah, I want you to follow him. He's on his way to the railroad station to get the 6 o'clock train for Albany. He's not supposed to get there, see? I get it. What'll I do to him, boss? I don't care what you do to him, but try to keep it legal. Leave it to me. Hello? Hello, is this the press room? I want to speak to Miss Johnson. I... Uh, who is this? Hilly, is this you? Oh, hello, Bruce. What is it? Hilly, something terrible has happened. I'm in jail. What? Some fella says I stole his watch. Stole his watch? What are you talking about? Some fella on the street. He said I stole his watch and then he had me arrested. Well, what fella? Who? I never saw him before. His name is Louis Peluso. Louis Peluso? Oh, Bruce, where are you? I'm in jail. He says that I... Well, I... now I know. What jail? The 43rd Precinct. Hilly, I didn't steal oh, his... I know. Hello, Murphy calling. I'm still in the press room. Nothing new on the Williams case. I'll call you if something happens. Hello, boys. Well, oh, Sheriff Caldwell. Sheriff, this is an honor. Got the kidding, boys. Here, I got the tickets for the hanging. One each, that's all. Hey, Pete, why can't you hang this guy at 5 o'clock instead of 7? Sure, it wouldn't hurt you, and we can make the city addition. Well, that's kind of raw, fellas. You can't hang a man in his sleep just to please a newspaper. No, but you can reprieve him twice so the hanging is three days before election. Yeah, so you and the mayor can run on a law and order ticket. Honest, boys, I had absolutely nothing to do with those reprieves. Yeah? How do we know there won't be another reprieve tonight? What if this guy Egelhopper finds Williams insane? He won't find him insane because he isn't. He's just as sane as I am. Sane? Sane. Oh, you (laughs) fellas make me (laughs) tired. You try to do a decent turn for you want to. Hiya, Hildy. Where have you been? To the 43rd precinct. Hello, Post. This is Hildy Johnson. Get Walter Burns on the phone. Oh, what's the matter, Hildy? You look sore. Oh, you stick around and watch your lady burn. Uh-oh, something... Hello? Hello? Hello, Walter. This is Hildy. Hello, oh, yeah, Hildy. I've got some news for you. Oh, smart. You got the interview? Yeah, I've got something much more Wait important. Oh, quiet, Maybe you better quiet, get a quiet, pencil and take it down. All set, Hildy. Let it go. Now get this, you double-crossing chimpanzee. There isn't going to be any interview. Wait a minute, Hildy. And there isn't going to be any story. And that certified check of yours leaves with me in 20 minutes. I wouldn't cover the burning of Rome for you if they were just lighting it. What are you and if about? I ever lay my two eyes on you again, I'll hammer that monkey skull of yours so it rings like a Chinese gong. Hey, what are you sore about? So- oh, you don't know what I'm sore about? No. Well, maybe you'd better get Louie to tell you the story of his watch. Goodbye. Oh, 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 nice oh, going, Hilly. That's telling him. That gentleman was my farewell speech to journalism. Goodbye, boys. I'm off to Albany. Send us a postcard, kid. I'll do that. When will we see you again, Hilly? Well, the next time you see me, I'll be riding in a limousine giving out interviews on success. So long. What the? Is that a shot? It sure sounded like it. Hey, listen. It's a jail break. Come here, that window. What? Hey, hey, what's the matter down there? What's happened? What's that gate? Close that gate. Too late. Who got away? Who was it? Where are William? Where are William? William? Where is he? Give me a phone. Hell Give me a phone. Hello, Tribune. Bill William just broke jail. Why are you shooting your dope to look out where you're aiming? We better get out of here. There's some phones in the state's attorney's office. Come on. Yeah, hey, on. Hello, Post. Hildy Johnson, get me Walter Burns, quick. Hello, Walter, this is Hildy. Hi, listen, Hildy. Shut up. Earl Williams just escaped from jail. What? That's all I know. Stick by the phone until you hear from me. Hildy, have you told me? Yeah, yeah, don't worry. I'm on the job. In just a moment, Mr. DeMille and our stars Claudette Colbert, Fred McMurray, and Jack Carson will bring you Act Two of His Girl Friday. And now, oh, Sally. What does that remind you of? Why, that tune always makes me think of the old South, of dashing young officers courting charming little southern bells. It it makes me think of magnolia trees and crinolines and organdy ruffles and, well, Scarlet O'Hara. Good. And this tune, Sally. Oh, everybody thinks of Lux Toilet Soap when they hear that, Mr. Ruick. Yes, Lux Toilet Soap. Right. And now if you add those two tunes together, it reminds you that the makers of Lux Toilet Soap have captured the charm of the Old South for you in their exquisite Scarlet O'Hara brooch. The brooch is a lovely simulated cameo 
designed after one worn by Vivian Lee in Gone with the Wind. The piece consists of a pure white head in classic profile against a glistening ebony background. It's the sort of brooch every woman longs to own and would be more than proud to wear because the brooch is truly beautiful and it's expensive looking too with its distinctive gold finished setting. It has every single detail. It has so many touches that make for beauty and quality, including a safety class. Well, don't forget to tell everyone how easy it is to get one of those brooches, Mr. Ruick. Yes, Sally, thanks. It's as easy as, well, as falling in love with a lovely Lux Toilet Soap complexion. Now, here's all you do. Just go to your dealer, buy three cakes of gentle white Lux Toilet Soap, and ask him for an order blank. Or write your name and address on a piece of paper and send it with the three Lux Toilet Soap wrappers and 15 cents in coins, no stamps, please, to Lux Toilet Soap, Box 1, New York City. I'll repeat that. Lux Toilet Soap, Box 1, New York City. It's as easy as that. And your Scarlet O'Hara brooch will be mailed to you promptly. Only, please don't delay. With your brooch, you'll receive an illustrated order blank for handsome matching pieces to complete your Scarlet O'Hara ensemble. Ring, bracelet, pendant, earrings. All beautifully designed, all at amazing bargain prices. So get your three cakes of Lux toilet soap tomorrow and send the wrappers and 15 cents in coin for your Scarlet O'Hara brooch to Lux toilet soap, Box 1, New York City. This offer is good only in the United States. And now, our producer, Mr. DeMille. Act two of His Girl Friday, starring Claudette Colbert as Hilde Johnson and Fred McMurray as Walter Burns, with Jack Carson as Bruce Baldwin. With the maniac Earl Williams roaming free in the city, things are happening fast around the criminal courts building. The press room is deserted for the moment. When suddenly, Hildy Johnson sweeps through the door and grabs a telephone. Hello. Hello, Post. Walter Burns, right away. Hildy? Walter, listen. I've got the whole story on how Williams escaped, and I've got it exclusive. Exclusive? Yeah, that's right. And it's a pip. But it cost me 450 bucks to tear it out of Cooley. Oh, never mind. What's the story? Now, just a minute. I'm telling you first I had to give him all the money I had on me. And it wasn't exactly mine. It's Bruce's money, and I want it back. Bruce's money? Sure, you'll get it. I, I swear it on my mother's grave. All right. Wait a minute. Your mother's alive. Oh, don't be so technical, Hilly. What's, what's the story? All right, here. It's the jailbreak of your dreams. Listen, this expert Egelhoff with a profound thinker from New York was giving Williams a final sanity test in the sheriff's office, yeah. you know, sticking a lot of pins in him to get his reflexes. Yeah. Well, he decided to reenact the crime exactly as it had taken place so as to study Williams' powers of coordination. Uh -huh. Of course, he had to have a gun to reenact the crime with, and who do you suppose supplied it? Who? Oh. Sheriff Peter B. Hartwell, B for brain. No kidding, you. Oh, I'm not kidding. I'm not good enough to make this one up. Go on. Well, the sheriff gave his gun to the professor, the professor gave it to Earl, and Earl shot the professor in the stomach and jumped out of the window. Hildy, this is terrific. Was Egelhopper hurt? No, not badly. They took him to the county hospital where they're awfully afraid he'll recover. Oh, that's great work, Hildy. Yeah. Now, what about my 450 bucks? You'll get it in 15 minutes. I'd better get it in 15 minutes. Listen, Hildy, have I ever lied to you? I tell you, you'll have that door right away. Louie's right here in the office, and I'll send him over to the press room with it. All right, Walter. I'll trust you once more, but don't fail me, will you? Bruce is waiting downstairs in a taxi. Oh, he is? Uh, wait a minute, Hildy. Hey, Louie. Louie, come here. Yeah, boss. Is that bangle dame outside? You mean that blonde babe? Yeah. Get her in here. Walter! Walter, Walter, listen! Just a minute, Hildy. Be right with you. Here she is, boss. Hiya, Walter. Come here. Now, get this straight. There's a guy waiting in a taxi in front of the criminal courts building. His name is Bruce Baldwin. Walter. Get over there right away. You want me to go into my act? Yeah, can you handle him? I never flopped on you yet, have I? All right, beat it. You've only got ten minutes. Say, hey, Walter, I'm still on here. Okay, Hildy, sorry to keep you waiting. Walter, about that $450. I know, I know. Hold on a minute. Hey, Louie, I need $450 in counterfeit money. $450? Yeah, in counterfeit. Can you I, get it for me? I got that much right here in my pocket. Well, that's a coincidence. Take it over to Hildy. Do you want I should tell him it's phony? No, you don't. Just give it to her. Okay. Hello, Hildy. <laughs> It's on the way. Well, it better be. Goodbye. Goodbye, Hildy. Oh, and Hildy, good luck on your honeymoon, honey. Press room. Yeah. Wait a minute. Hey, Hildy Johnson. Right here. Thanks. Hello? Hello, Hildy. Bruce, I thought you were waiting in the taxi. Hildy, something awful has happened. What? Hilly, listen. I'm in jail again. Oh, for the love of... What for? 
for? Well, they called it mashing. Oh, you didn't, did you? Oh, no, Hildy. I was sitting right in the taxi right where you left me, and the young lady seemed to have a dizzy spell. And... Well, was she a blonde? Yeah, she's a blonde, very blonde. Oh, and... never mind. I know what happened. Bruce, where are you? The 26th precinct. All right, I'll get you out as soon as I can. Goodbye. Anything I can do, Hildy? Yeah, you can stab Walter Burns in the back for me, that dirty double. Oh. Listen, I've got to bail somebody out again. How much money have you got? Dollar eighty. Andy, how about you? Sixty-four cents. Oh, thanks. You can buy an annuity. Hey, Hildy, look sore again. Press room, Q speaking. No, I can't get an official statement yet. Hey, boys, here's the mayor. Uh, wait a minute. The mayor just walked in. I'll call you back. Well, what do you say, mayor? How about a statement? Yeah, come on, mayor. Get quiet, out of here. quiet, 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 please. Don't pester me now, boys. I've got a lot on my mind. Have you seen Sheriff Hartwell? It's hard to tell you, Ronnie. You see, there's so many cockroaches around here. Now, wait a minute. What about that statement, John? Sure, we're going to press in 20 minutes. Boys, boys. Give us a statement on the election. Yeah, what effect is all this going to have on the voters? None whatsoever. How can an unavoidable misfortune like this have any influence on the upright citizens of our fair city? Baloney. Uh, Excuse me, boys. This is Anna here. Where's the mayor? Uh, hi, Sheriff. Here, Sheriff. Mayor, I, I've been looking all over for you. I've been looking for you. We've got to have a talk, Sheriff. And so do we. What's the dope, Sheriff? How did Williams get out? And what was he doing in your office, Sheriff? Where did he get the gun? Now, wait, wait. Just a minute, boys, and I'll tell you. I've got him located. Who, Williams? Where? Out at the place he used to live on Center Street. I just got the tape. Why didn't you oh, say no. so? The rifle squad's just going out. Well, Mayor, you wanted to see me? I certainly did. Pete, you're through. Through? I mean, I'm scratching your name off the ticket Tuesday and running Sherman in your place. Oh, now, Fred, I'm doing everything I can. Well, it ain't enough. Do you realize there are 200,000 votes at stake, and if Earl Williams don't hang, we're going to lose him? But we're going to hang him, Fred. He can't get away. Come in. Excuse me, I'm looking for... What do you for... want? Are you Sheriff Hartwell? I'm Hartwell. What is it? Uh, you're a hard fellow to find, Sheriff. I have a message here from the governor. What's from the governor? It's a reprieve for Earl Williams. For who? Earl Williams' reprieve. Pete, you said there wasn't going to be a reprieve. Fred, please. It frightens me to think of what I'd like to do to you. Fred. Shut up. You, come here. You mean me? Yeah. Who else was there when the governor gave you this reprieve? Nobody. He was out fishing. Pete, get the governor on the phone. Oh, he's not there now. He's out duck shooting. Fishing? <laughs> duck shooting? A guy does nothing more strenuous for 40 years than play pinochle. He gets elected governor, and right away he thinks he's Tarzan. Look at this reprieve, Fred. Insane, he says. He knows very well that Williams isn't insane. Well, I never Pure met the politics. man, but I... Hello? Yes, yes, this is Hartwell. What? Where? Holy Moses. Hold the wire a minute. Well, what is it? They got Williams. They got him surrounded. The rifle squad has him out in his house. Tell him to hold the wire. Hold the wire. Cover up that transmitter. You, come here. Now, listen. You never arrived with this reprieve, get it? Yes, I did. Don't you remember? I came in that door. Well, how much do you make a week? Uh, twenty-two fifty. How would you like to have a job for three hundred and fifty dollars a month? That's almost a hundred dollars a week. Who me? Well, who do you think? Uh, now listen. They need a fellow like you in the city sealer's office. In the what? In the city sealer's office. You mean I should work in the city? Yes. Oh, my wife wouldn't like that. Well, why not? Well, you see, my wife lives uh, with my family in the country. Well, that's and... all right. Just bring her here. We'll pay all your expenses. Oh, this puts me in a peculiar position. No, it doesn't. Now, remember, you never delivered this reprieve. You, uh, you got caught in traffic or something. Now, get out of here and don't let anybody see you. Yes, but how do I, I mean, know? I'm in my office tomorrow. Oh, by the way, what's your name? Pettibone. What's yours? Pettibone. Really? No, 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 no. Listen, <laughs> all you've got to do is to lay low and keep your mouth shut. Well, I'm tired anyhow. All right, now beat it, beat it. Okay, but it's a funny thing. Go on, I beat it. Get out, get out. Hello? Hello, wait a minute. What'll I tell him, Mayor? Tell him to shoot to kill. What? You heard what I said. But the reprieve... Quiet to... and do as I tell you. Hello, Olson. Shoot to kill. That's orders. <laughs> Come in, come in. Hiya, Hildy. Oh, it's you, you double-crossing hyena. What did you and Mr. Burns pull this time? What's the matter, Hildy? Don't give me that innocent stuff. You had Mr. Baldwin thrown in the jug again. Who, me? Oh, shut up. Did you bring that money? Oh, yeah, 400 bucks. 450? All right, you can't blame a guy for trying. Here, and you better give me a receipt. I'll give you a scar. Yeah, I got plenty of them. So long, Hildy. So long, you rat. Hello, hello, operator. I want to call the 26th Precinct Police Station. Stop that phone, or I'll kill you. Never mind, operator. Hello, Earl. You're not going to tell anybody where I am. I got away from them, across the roof, down the fire escape. They'll never get me. Earl, 
Put down that gun. No, no, I won't. No, you're not going to shoot me, Earl. I'm your friend, remember? Uh, I was in your cell a little while ago. I, I've got to write that story about you, remember? You, you don't want to hurt your friends, don't Earl. Don't you move. Maybe you are my friend and maybe you're not. You can't trust anybody in this crazy world. I don't blame you. If I were in your place, I wouldn't trust anybody. Either. Wait a minute. Where are you going? I was just going to pull down the shade so no one will see no, you. No, you're not. You were going to get somebody. No, I wouldn't get anybody. Earl. Yes, you will. You get him after me again. I won't let you do it. No. I'll kill you. You will. Don't shoot. Uh, I guess I fired all the shells. Oh. Oh, give me that gun. Oh, I'm awful tired. Now, listen. Those reporters will be coming back here any minute. I don't care. I'm not afraid to die. I was telling the fellow that when he handed me the gun. Keep quiet. Hello, Post. Walter Burns. Waking me up in the middle of the night. Talking to me about things they don't understand. Shut up. I wish they'd take me back and hang me. They will if you don't keep quiet. Burns talking. Walter, Hildy, something terrific's happened. You better get down here right away. What's the matter? I've got Earl Williams. What? Earl Williams right here in the press room. I've got him. On the level? So help me, but hurry, I need you. Open up. Hildy, open up. Walter. Well, where is he? Oh, I thought you'd never get here. Come on in, Louie. Close that door. Okay, boss. I brought Louie along just in case. Now, where's William? He's in the desk. What? What desk? That's the big one there. I stuck him in there and pulled down the roller. No. Well, open it up and let's get a look at him. Oh, you Williams? Let me out of here. I can't stand it in here. Shut up. You're sitting pretty. <gasps> hey, get back in there. Who's that at the door? Oh, I don't Hildy. know. Hildy, let me in. Oh, for the love of Mike, it's Bruce's mother. Hildy, come in. Kelly, are you crazy? Don't let that dame in here. I've got to. I'll get rid of her right away. William. Oh, come in, Mother. Oh. Don't you mother me, playing cat and mouse with my poor boy, keeping him locked up. But mother, I can explain Making that. us miss two trains and you supposed to get married tomorrow. I'll go with you in five minutes. You don't have to go with me at all. Just give me Bruce's money and you can stay here forever as far as I'm concerned. Oh, please, Mother. Let me out of here. Shut up. What was that? What, Lady What? There's a man in that desk. Oh, don't be silly, Lady. What would a man be doing in a desk? There's something funny here. Shut up, will you, Lady? Don't shut up. You're doing something wrong. Oh, Mother, please. Louie, get this dame out of here. Oh, no, wait a minute. Go Walter. on, Louie, take her over to Pollock Mike. No. Hello, lady. Let me alone. My name is Louie Peluso. Oh, Walter. Lock her up and see that she doesn't talk to anyone on the way. Help! What do I tell him? Tell him oh. it's a case of DTs. Go on. Let me go. Come Let on, go. lady. Come Help! on. Hurry, Mother. This is only Help! temporary. Oh, Walter, what have you done? Come here, Hildy. Now, let me go. I've got to go with her. I've got to get Bruce out of jail. Get Bruce out of jail? How can you worry about a man who's resting in a nice, quiet station, when the police station, when this is going on? Hildy, this is war. You can't desert me now. Oh, get off that trapeze. You got your story right over there in the desk. Go on, smear it all over the front page. Earl Williams captured by the Morning Post. But I'm getting out. Oh, you're drooling idiot. What do you mean you're getting out? There are 365 days in the year you can get married, but how many times have you got a murderer locked up in a desk? Once in a lifetime. Hildy, you got the whole city by the seat of its pants. Oh, sure, I know, You I know. know, you know. You've got the brains of a pancake. That wasn't a story you covered. It was a revolution. This is the greatest yarn in journalism since Livingston discovered Stanley. It's the other way around. Oh, don't get technical. You realize what you've done? You've taken a city that's been graft-ridden for 40 years under the same old gang, and with one yarn, you're kicking them out. What? Sure. We'll make such monkeys out of these ward healers next Tuesday that nobody will vote for them. Not even their own wives. I get it, I get it. You've kicked over the whole city hall like an apple cart. you put one administration out and the other one in. This isn't just a newspaper story, Hildy. It's a career. Oh, Walter, I never figured it that way. Oh, you're still a doll-faced hick, that's why. We'll be the white-haired boys, Well, sure, we? sure. Well, Hildy, they'll be naming streets after you. Hildy Johnson Street. There'll be statues of you in the parks. By tomorrow morning, I'll bet you there's a Hildy Johnson cigar. I can see the billboards now. Light up with a Hildy Johnson. Oh, all right, Walter. Stop acting. <laughs> we have a lot of work to do. Well, now you're talking. What are you going to do with William? Oh, we'll take him over to my private office. Uh, where's our phone? That one over there. Oh, Walter, how are you going to take him out? They'll see him. Uh, we'll carry the desk over. Hello? You can't move the desk. It's crawling with cops outside. Well, we'll load out the window with pulleys. Now, quit stalling. Come on, start pounding out a lead. How much do you want on it? All the words you got. Hello, give me Duffy. Walter, can I call the mayor a bird of prey? Call him anything you like. Hello, Duffy, get set. We've got the biggest story of the year. Earl Williams captured by the Morning Post. Exclusive. Yeah. Hildy. Oh, Bruce. Hey, wait a minute, Duffy. What do you want here, Bruce? I came to see Hildy. Bruce, I'm awfully busy. Hildy, I just want you to ask you one question. How did you get out of jail? Not through any help of yours. Hey, listen, will you get out of here? Bruce, I'll explain the whole thing later. Where's Mama? 
She said she was coming up here. Well, she left. Oh, where did Mama go? Oh, I don't know. Out someplace. Well, I don't understand. Did she get the money? No, no, no. She left in a hurry. The money's right there in my purse. Now, Bruce, $450 right there. Take it. Hildy, I'm taking the 9 o'clock train. Oh, let her alone, will you, buddy? Bruce, please. I just wanted you to answer one question. You don't want to come with me, do you? Oh, Bruce. Answer me, Hildy. You don't want to, do you? Now, look here, my you good man. You shut up, Burns. You're doing all this to her. She wanted to get away from you and everything you stand for. Hildy, are you going to give up everything for a man like this? Oh, no, I'm not, but something's happened, Bruce. Wait till I tell you. You tell him nothing. He's a spy. I'm not fool. a spy. Hello. Hildy, you're coming with me right now. Oh, no, Bruce. Give me just a second. Can't you see? This is the biggest thing in my life. Oh, I see what you are now. You're just like Walter Burns and all the rest. Sure, sure. That's what I am. Well, I'm glad I found out in time. I'm leaving, Hildy. Hello, Duffy. Get hold of Butcher Connor. Well, if you change your mind, I'm leaving on the 9 o'clock train. Well, where is he? Wait. Bruce, listen. Uh... If you want me, take me as I am instead of trying to turn me into a housewife. I'm not a suburban bridge player. I'm a newspaper man. That's all I wanted to know. Goodbye, Hildy. Hildy, have you got that lead? Have I? Boy, take a look at this. It's terrific. <laughs> In just a moment, Mr. DeMille and our stars, Claudette Colbert, Fred McMurray, and Jack Carson, will bring you Act Three of His Girl Friday. And now we have an opportunity to take a look at the fall styles through the eyes of an expert, Miss Colma Flake, Western fashion editor of the famous publication, Motion Picture Magazine. As a mere man, Miss Flake, I won't presume to ask you specific questions on a subject that I know nothing about. So won't you go just ahead... Go right ahead and uh, give us a few highlights on current fashions. Well, Mr. Ruick, there are several important differences between this and last year's silhouette. While skirts are slimmer and straighter, slide drape uh, side da drapery is used on some costumes, but only to accent the essential lines of the skirt. In other words, simplicity of line and careful cutting of the fabric are most important. Woolen dresses in soft colors are high style. Many of them are to be worn with short fur jackets the color of the dress to blend with the fur. By the way, Barbara Stanwyck has such a costume in lovely beige and brown tones. Most women will be glad to hear that satin hats draped close to the head are in style. Worn with a woolen dress, they give that sophisticated look we all love. Paulette Goddard has ordered one in a stunning new light shade of brown. Black, of course, is more popular than ever. There is an effect of richness in many of the black costumes shown. This is achieved by touches of unexpected colors, especially olive, slate blue, or dull gold. The effect is made more striking by a single piece of handsome jewelry. If you have an heirloom piece in gold and black enamel, by all means, wear it. Personally, I certainly congratulate you, Mr. Ruick, on offering this beautiful Scarlet O'Hara brooch at this time. It's just the thing from a style point of view as well as lovely in itself. The pure white of the simulated cameo against the glistening ebony background is very striking, and the gold finished setting is very rich looking. It's quite perfect at the neckline of a black dress or with one of the dark greens or soft blues so popular right now. To sum up, styles will be simple and rich and distinguished looking this fall, and handsome jewelry pieces like this will be just the thing to complete the effect of simplicity and richness. Thank you, Miss Flake. Again, as a mere man, let me say that I'm glad those little satin hats are back again. I like them. And now let me tell all of you just once more how easy it is to get one of these handsome, simulated cameo brooches of the same design worn by Vivian Lee as Scarlett O'Hara in Gone with the Wind. Just get an order blank from your dealer or write your name and address on a piece of paper and mail it together with the wrappers from three cakes of Lux toilet soap and 15 cents in coin, no stamps, please, to Lux Toilet Soap, Box 1, New York City. You'll be thrilled and delighted with the beauty and the fine craftsmanship of your Scarlet O'Hara brooch. With your brooch, you'll receive an illustrated order blank telling you how to get additional matching pieces to complete your Scarlet O'Hara ensemble. You can have a ring, bracelet, pendant, earrings, all of the same lovely Scarlet O'Hara design and all at amazing bargain prices. So don't delay. Send three wrappers and 15 cents in coin to Box 1, New York City, 
for your Scarlet O'Hara brooch tomorrow. Remember the address. Lux Toilet Soap, Box 1, New York City. This offer is good only in the United States. We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Curtain rises on the third act of His Girl Friday. A few more whirlwind minutes have passed, and the convict Earl Williams is still safe and sound in the roll top desk. Hildy still types furiously to finish the story for the late edition, and Walter is still on the phone. Listen, Duffy, did you tell Bush to take a taxi that every minute counts? Well, who's he bringing with him? All right, stay near the phone. Butch is on his way over with four mugs. They're going to help us move out the desk. All we got to do is hold out for 15 minutes. The boys will be back. They'll be coming in here to phone. Hey, Williams, are you all right in there? Knock on the desk. Hey, listen, Williams. I'm going to knock three times. That's our signal, see? You get it? Answer with three knocks if you're okay. Atta, baby. Three knocks is me. Now, don't forget. You got enough air? Ah, good boy. Well, come on, Hildy. Tear into it. Don't sit there like a frozen robin. I just thought of something. You've messed up my whole life. Do you know that? Bruce is gone. His mother... What am I going to do? Oh, finish the story, Hildy. Duffy's waiting. I'd have been on that train by now. Come on, Hildy. Oh, what a sap I am falling for your line. Naming streets after me. Well, you've had a nice rest now. Get back to work, will you? Hello, who is it? Hey, boss, it's me. It's Louie. Now, wait a minute. Come on in quick. Listen, boss. Hey, what's the matter, Louie? Where'd you get that black eye? Boss. Where's Mrs. Baldwin? What'd you do with her? Where is she? You been in a fight? Down Western Avenue we was going, 65 miles an hour. You know what I mean? Hey, take that mush out of your mouth. Where's the old lady? I'm telling you, we run smack into a police patrol. You know what I mean? We busted it in half. Oh, was she hurt? Can you imagine bumping into a load of cops? They come rolling out like oranges. But what did you do with her? Search me. When I come to, I was running down 34th Street. Oh, Butterfingers. You'd be an old dame to take somewhere and you hand her over to the cops. What do you mean I hand her? The cops was on the wrong side of the street. Yeah, now everything's fine. She's probably squawking her head off in some police station. I don't think she's squawking much. You know what I mean? Well, oh, don't tell me. You mean she was killed? There's an awful good chance. Oh, my... Dad! Oh, this is the end. Oh, no, it's fate, Hildy. What will be, will be. But what am I going to say to Bruce? What can I tell him? Oh, look, honey, if he really loves you, you won't have to tell him anything. Oh, I killed her. I'm responsible. Oh, what am I going to do? How can I ever face him again? Look at me, Hildy. I'm looking at you, you murderer. Oh, now, if it was my own mother, I'd carry on. You know I would for the paper. <laughs> Louis, where did it happen? Western and 34th. I'm going out. Hey, we can do more right here. Now, be calm. Be calm? Be... How can I? Open the door! Open that hey, listen. door! Hey, listen. Force, Sheriff. Yeah, and the reporters from every sheet in town. Now we're in a sweet oh, spot. I don't know, Spot. I'm leaving. Don't open that door, Hildy. Just a minute, Johnson. Let me alone. Don't let it get away, Sheriff. Take your hands off. Hold me. there, boys. Hey, just a minute, Sheriff. Who do you think you are breaking in here like this? You can't bluff me, Burns. I don't care who you are or what paper you're editor now, of. Let me go. Let me go, fellas. Something's happened to Mrs. Bull. Hang on to her. Hey, what's the idea? I'll tell you what the idea is. One of the prisoners was looking out of the jail window about an hour ago, and he saw a man come down the fire escape and into this window. That man was Earl Williams. What are you oh, doing, good. Hildy? Hiding him for a scoop? Yeah, I don't know anything about it. Let me out of here. He knows plenty. Come on, Sheriff. Give her the third degree. Where is he, Johnson? Where you got him? You're barking up the wrong tree, Sheriff. I'll give you three minutes to tell me where he is. Come on, where is he? All right. He went over to the hospital to call on Professor Egelhofer. What? Yeah, with a big bag of marshmallows. Here, lady, is this the place? Yes, yes, oh. it's the place, officer. Mother, I'm so glad to see you. Are you all right? That's the man, officer, right there. What's the idea here? This lady claims she was kidnapped, Sheriff. What? They dragged me all the way down the stairs and put me in a taxi cab. Just a minute. Did this man here have anything to do with it? Now, listen, Why, I... he was the one in charge of the whole thing. He told them to kidnap me. Excuse me, madam, are you referring to me? You know you did. What about this, Burns? Kidnapping, huh? Oh, trying to frame me, eh? Huh? I never saw this woman before in my life. Oh, what a thing to say. Now, look here, madam. Be honest. If you were out joyriding, plastered, and getting to some scrape, why don't you admit it? Instead of accusing innocent people. Oh, you, you ruffian. How dare you talk like that to me? He's just a little crazy, mother. I'll tell you something more. Yes? I'll tell you why he did it. Go on, madam. I was in here, and they had someone with them. They were hiding him. Hiding him? In here? Yes. Madam, that's a bare-faced lie. What was that? Burns just banged on that desk. Yeah, but someone banged back. There's somebody in that desk. Earl Williams. It's Earl Williams. He's in the desk. Stand back, you men. 
Come out, William. Come out, do you hear? We've got you covered. Open that desk. All right. You got me. Now, go ahead. Shoot me. Grab it. Grab that man. I got him, Sheriff. Take him down to the jail and swear out a warrant for the arrest of Walter Burns and Hildy Johnson. Sheriff Hartwell speaking. Oh, yes, Prostowski. Come over to the press room as soon as you can. The mayor and I are holding a couple of important birds. We want you to take their confession. Shake it up. Be over in ten minutes, Mayor. Fine work, Pete. Fine work. You certainly delivered the goods. I'm proud of you. Look kind of natural with handcuffs on, don't they, Fred? <laughs> a sight for sore eyes. <laughs> Aiding an escaped criminal and a little charge of kidnapping. Hmm. <laughs> Looks like about ten years apiece for you, Worth. Does it? Anytime you think you can lick the morning post, it's time for you to get out of town. Oh, your luck's not with you now. It isn't going to help you this time. You're through. Listen, the last man who said that to me cut his throat a week later. Oh, is that so? Yeah. We've been in worse jams than this, haven't we, Hildy? Nope. You forget the power that always watches over the morning post. Well, it's not with you now. Yeah, you're going to be in office about two days more. Yeah, and then we're pulling your nose right out of the feed bag. Oh, the power of the press. Listen, huh? bigger men than you have found out what the power of the press is. Presidents and kings. Hello, Sheriff. Oh, but... Get out of here. You remember me? My name is Pettibone. Get out, get out, get out. Here's your reprieve, Sheriff. Did you hear me? Beat it. You can't bribe me. Now, my wife says... Hey, what is this? Get out of here. No, I won't. Here's your reprieve. I don't want to be a city sealer. Uh, 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 Pete, who is this man? Well, I don't know, Fred. Get out. Just a minute. Who is trying to bribe you? Well, they wouldn't take the reprieve. What did I tell you? An unseen <laughs> power. Why, the man's insane. <laughs> a frame up. Trying to hang an innocent man to win an election, That's huh? That's a lie. I never saw him before. Say, you, what's your name? Pettibone, Joe Pettibone. What's yours? When did you deliver this reprieve, Pettibone? Who did you talk to? Well, they started right in bribing me. Well, who's they? Them. Those two men. Why, oh. that's absurd on the face of it. He's he's talking like a child. Out of the mouths of babes. Why, he's <laughs> insane or, or drunk or something. Why, uh, if this unfortunate man, Williams, has really been reprieved, I personally am tickled to death. Aren't you, Pete? Oh, sure. You'd hang your own mother to be reelected. Uh, that's a horrible thing to say about anybody, Miss Johnson. Well, never mind that now. Let's have your story, Mr. Pettibone. Well, 19 years ago, I married Mrs. Pettibone. Yes, and... yes, well, you can skip all that. <laughs> Sheriff? Sheriff, this reprieve is authentic. Our Commonwealth has been spared the painful necessity of shedding blood. Oh, get down over the soapbox. Save that for the Tribune. <clears throat> uh, Pete, take those handcuffs off my friend. I was just going to. Well, hurry up, hurry up. I'm amazed at you doing a thing like that. Well, I, uh, I was only doing my duty. Uh, nothing personal in it. No, of course not, of course <laughs> not. Uh, what did you say your name was? Uh, Pettibone. Here's a picture of my wife. Oh, yes, a very fine-looking woman. Uh, she's good enough for me, but if my wife heard uh, that... I... I understand that perfectly, Mr. Pettibone, and as long as I am mayor... Which ought to be about three hours more, I'd say. Uh, Just long enough for us to put out a special edition asking for your recall. And your arrest. You know, you little boys ought to get about ten years apiece, I think. Now, I wouldn't make any hasty decisions, Mr. Burns. You might run into a thumping big libel suit. <laughs> You're going to run into the governor. <laughs> well, my old friend, the governor, and I understand each other perfectly. Yes, and so do I. So I... do you what you who do. Uh, and now, Mr. Pettibone, if you'll come with us, we'll take you over to the warden's office and deliver this reprieve. Come along, Pettibone. So long, Walter. So long, you crook. Right this way. <laughs> Wait until those two future bail jailbirds read the morning post tomorrow. <sighs> that was a tight squeeze. Hello, give me Duffy. That was the worst jam we've been in in a long time. Yeah. What? Well, where is he? Well, get him. You remember the time we stole old Lady Haggerty's stomach off the coroner's position? Yeah. We proved she'd been poisoned. Yeah. <laughs> we had to hide out for a week. Do you remember that? The Shoreland Hotel. That's how we happened. Yeah, to... don't forget, we could have gone to jail for that, too. You know that. Yeah, I guess we could. Yeah. You know, maybe you're right, Hildy. It's a bad business. You're better off out of it. You better get going. Where'll I go? To Bruce, of course. Well, you know he's gone. He took the 9 o'clock train. Well, just send him a wire and get on that train. He'll be waiting for you at the station when you get to Albany. Get going, Hildy. Get going, Hildy. What is that with you? Can't you understand? I'm doing something noble for once in my life. Now, go on, get out of here before I change my mind. Walter, listen. Go on, it's tough enough now. Just a minute. Go on, send the fellow a wire. He'll be waiting when you get there. Oh, I get it. 
the same old act, isn't it? Trying to push me out of here, figuring that I'll be stupid enough to want to stay. I know I deserve that, Hildy. Hello. Oh, wait a minute, Duffy. But this time you're wrong, Hildy. I made fun of Bruce and Albany and all that sort of thing. You know why? Why? Because I was jealous of him. Because I was sore at him for offering you the sort of life that I can't give you. That's what you want, isn't it? Well, I, I could stay and do the story and take the train in the morning. No, 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 no. Forget it. Goodbye, dear, and good luck. Oh, hold on a second, Duffy. I'll answer that. Hello, Hildy Johnson. Hildy, this is Bruce. Bruce? Hildy, something awful has happened. Oh, Bruce, not again. What jail are you in? The 24th precinct. <laughs> but what for? We're trying to pass counterfeit money. What do you mean, counterfeit money? Where did you get it? You gave it to me. I did? Oh. Hildy, I've got to get out of here. Oh, okay. I'll fix it up somehow. Hey, Duffy, hang on. Oh. oh, no, honey, don't cry, please. I, I didn't mean to make you cry. You never cried before. I, I thought you were really sending me away to Bruce. I didn't know you had him locked up. I, I thought you were going to stand by and let me go off with Bruce and not do a thing about it. Oh, go on. What did you think? I wasn't a chump. I thought you didn't love me. Well, what were you thinking with? I don't know. Well, what are you standing there gawking for? We have to get him out of jail. Send Louie down and give him some honest money so he can go back to Albany where he belongs. Sure, sure. Hey, hey Duffy, tell Louie to stand by. And yeah, we're coming over to the office. No, don't worry about the story. Hildy's going to write it. No, she's not quitting. She never intended to. We're going to get married. Can we go on a honeymoon this time, Walter? Sure, honey. Hey, Duffy, you can be managing editor. No, not permanently. Just for a couple of weeks while we're on our honeymoon. Oh, Walter. I don't know where we're going. Hey, Hildy, where are we going? Niagara Falls. Niagara Falls, Duffy. A whole two weeks, Walter? What? I can't hear you, Duffy. Strike. What strike? In Albany? Oh, I can't ask. He'll be to spend... We'll spend our honeymoon in Albany. Okay, Duffy. Well, isn't that a coincidence? Come on, Hildy, we've got to go to Albany. Say, I, uh, I wonder if Bruce can put us up. <laughs> The curtain falls, and whatever the future of Hildy and her boss, I imagine it won't be dull. Now, Claudette Colbert and Fred McMurray return to the microphone. Well, it seems a little quiet here, CB. Hmm. No guns, no telephones, no sirens. How can you stand it, Fred? If I ever acquire a newspaper, you two are hired. <laughs> and instead of seeing a picture or listening to the radio for entertainment, I, I, I'll just go down to the office. I wouldn't count too much on the profit, CB. Funny thing, though, the last time I played one of these reporter parts, it was in a picture with Claudette, the Gilded Lily. And they tell me that Claudette, as a foreign correspondent, has a very sharp eye for news in Arise, My Love, that you just finished for Paramount. Well, C.B., this may not be news, but I have enjoyed coming back to the Lux Radio Theater. And I'm still a staunch supporter of Lux Soap. I think it's a grand complexion care, and I use it all the time. But it's possible you've heard me say that before. Mm -hmm. That's something we can't hear too often about Lux Soap, Claudette. Because... We know it's true, and because it comes from you. What's the prospect for next week, C.B.? The prospect for next Monday, Fred, well, we're, we're flying high. Our play is Wings of the Navy, and our stars are George Brent, Olivia de Havilland, and John Payne. It's an exciting drama of adventure in the air and romance on the ground. A story of heroism and sacrifice with George Brent and John Payne as aviators and Olivia de Havilland as the girl they both love. I remember the picture, C.B., and I know you'll have a thrilling play next Monday night. Good night. Good night. Good night. And in the words of one W. Winter, orchids to both of you. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents George Brent Olivia de Havilland and John Payne in Wings of the Navy. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. Heard in tonight's play were Arthur Q. Bryan as Sheriff, Edward Marr as Louie, Lou Merrill as Mayor, Chester Clute as Pettibone, Warren Ash as McHugh, Charles Seal as Murphy, Edwin Max as Endicott, Verna Felton as Mrs. Baldwin, 
Tony Hughes as Earl Williams, Sherman Nichols as Duffy, and Catherine Keyes and Hal Gerard. Fred McMurray is currently appearing on the screen in the Paramount picture, Rangers of Fortune. Jack Carson is featured in the RKO picture, Lucky Partners. His Girl Friday was based on the front page by Ben Hecht and Charles MacArthur. The Scarlet O'Hara brooch offered you by the makers of Lux Toilet Soap is designed after one worn by Vivian Lee in Gone with the Wind, the Selznick International picture produced by David O. Selznick and released by Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer. Our music is directed by Louis Silvers, and your announcer has been Melville Ruick. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. I do the very best I know how, the very best I can. And if the end brings me out wrong, ten angels swearing I was right would make no difference. Mr. President, starring Edward Arnold and written by Gene Holloway. Mr. President at home in the White House, the elected leader of our people, our fellow citizen and neighbor. These are little-known stories of the men who have lived in the White House. Dramatic, exciting events in their lives that you and I so rarely hear. True human stories of Mr. President. Our Mr. President drama will begin in just a moment. The American concept of the president as a federal executive is unique in the history of world politics. When our Constitution was framed, many Americans thought president was just another word for king. In fact, some of the titles suggested as appropriate for the new head of state were Your Majesty the President, Your Mightiness, and Your Excellency. But Washington chose president, meaning the one who presides. A wise choice. For an American president is very much like a presiding chairman of a board who must maintain peace and amity among other divisions of the government. To such a coordinator come inevitable compromises, adjustments, and personal disappointments. You'll hear them dramatically presented now on Mr. President. So listen and see if you can name the president upon whom this episode is based. The incidents I have in mind today tell the story of a president in a strange dream. It's a story we've told before on this series, but one which we feel is well worth hearing again, especially during the Easter season. Later on, of course, I'll tell you which president this happened to. But meanwhile, you may be able to guess. He woke early. He woke to an unaccustomed, wonderful feeling of great happiness. And for a moment, he lay there wondering why. And then suddenly the warm, reassuring knowledge started pulsing through him again. The long war was over. He got up, put on a dressing gown, and went over to the window. He stood there looking out at the calm, sweet coming of the Washington dawn. From his window he could see the flags and buntings of victory, and he stood there grinning at them. Suddenly his bedroom door opened cautiously. Oh, good morning, Father. I thought you'd be up. Oh, good morning, son. You're up early. Well, I woke up. What are you going to do today? Oh, nothing very unusual. Office business, interviews, a cabinet meeting. Tonight, I think your mother and I are going out. You forgot the war department. Oh, yes, I did. You never mentioned them once. They wouldn't like that. <laughs> well, I, I'll have to go to the war department at least twice, though. It looks like it's going to be a nice day. Yes, indeed. You know, sometimes you wake up and you think, this is my day. 
This is the day when things are going to go well for me. From beginning to end, this is my day. Didn't you ever feel that way? Yes, sir. A couple of times. And every time I did, I ended up getting a licking. <laughs> oh, and speaking of lickings, that reminds me. You are not to stand downstairs where the people wait for their interviews and charge them five cents to see me. Well, it's a very reasonable rate. Well, that's not the point. Well, you said you wanted me to be enterprising. Well, you'll have to find some other way to do it. Well, Secretary Stanton scolded me about that, too. He said you weren't worth five cents. Oh, he did? He said when anyone could see her for nothing, why should some people have to pay five cents? I don't think it's right. They should have to pay. Why? Because I need the money. Oh, I see, I see. Oh, good morning, Mother. Good morning. I thought I'd find you two in here together. Morning, dear. Good morning. Did you have a good night's sleep? Wonderful, Mary. And how about you? Well, the shouting in the streets kept me awake. Everyone's certainly excited about the prospect of peace. Well, those same voices put me to sleep. And it was the first good night's sleep I've had in months. Well, it's been a strain, but it's almost over now. Oh, son. Yes, Mother? There's a woman downstairs with a tray of apples and gingerbread and candy that she says you bought. I'll go right now. Oh, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh, they're steady. What's this all about? I'm setting up a fruit stand down the Grand Corridor. <laughs> You're doing what? A fruit stand. I'm going to show the people who are waiting in line to see Father. <laughs> now, see here, don't you laugh at him. You'll only encourage him. <laughs> yes, you're right. Uh, son, uh, what did I just explain to you about people waiting for interviews? You said I couldn't charge him five cents to see you. Well, I should think not. But I'm not charging him to see Father now. I'm charging him for apples. This time they're getting something for the money. <laughs> oh, indeed, indeed. Well, you can't do it, and that's final. Uh, now, wait a minute, dear, wait a minute. Where did you get the money to buy this woman's stock? I saved my pocket money, and I got a few things from the White House kitchen by saying I was hungry. And one of the carpenters got me a pair of trestles and a wide board to put the things on. In the corridor of the White House? Well, I'm an American citizen. I got rights. You haven't any rights to peddle things in the White House. Well, I've already bought the thing. All right, all right, now... You go see your woman and set up your store. Gee, dear. thanks, Father. I knew you wouldn't let Mother take away my rights. Oh, <laughs> we'll be the laughing stock of Washington. <laughs> my dear, he has to have a chance to learn a few things for himself, even if he is the son of a president. All children are entitled to put up some sort of a lemonade stand once in their lives. <laughs> All right, Mr. President. Uh, uh, come here by the window, my dear. Now let me put my arm around you. That's a fine sight down there. Look at those red, white, and blue decorations. The Yankee Doodle colors of freedom and liberty and justice for all. Oh, it's good to see you so happy, dear. Oh, I am happy for the first time in a long, long while. I am happy. I can see an end to the insight now. Peace for the country and time for you and me to settle down and love one another. I'm afraid I haven't had much time to be a husband the past few years. I can't imagine a more fortunate woman in the nation than your wife, Mr. President. <laughs> oh, God, love you for saying that. Oh, darling, put me down. <laughs> oh, someone came in. <laughs> Remember oh. when I used to spin you around oh, like this? Oh, someone <laughs> might see. <laughs> and if they do. Well, isn't it important that the president and his wife have dignity? No, no, dear, not half so important as that the president and his wife be human beings. Oh. I love you, and I don't care if the Senate, the House of Representatives, and the War Department know it. Oh, stop. <laughs> and see that I get a big breakfast this morning. Double on everything. You know, I could eat the White House? Yes, sir. Oh, I meant to ask you. Sunday's Easter. You'll want to give some sort of message, won't you? Is Sunday Easter? Yes, it is. Oh, I lost track of time. Then, then this is Good Friday. Yes, Good Friday. Mm-hmm. Well, the news of peace will certainly make it a joyous Easter. Woman, what about my breakfast? I'm hungry. Immediately, Mr. President. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
streets are crowded with people. Oh, don't talk with your mouth full, son. Yes, it certainly is an exciting day. The general's arrived at the war department. Oh, he has, has he? And how is it that you get so much information before I do? Oh, I got connections. <laughs> hmm. Well, then maybe you know if the general and his wife are joining your father and me tonight. I uh, sent over a note asking them to go to the theater with us, dear. He doesn't know yet. Oh, he doesn't? And how do you know that? He hasn't had a chance to ask his wife. <clears throat> Are you inferring that a general who makes decisions involving thousands of men has to ask his wife if he can go out? Yes, sir. Mary, do you consider that democracy? <laughs> no, sir. That's marriage. Hello, Dad, Mother. Robert! Oh, Robert! Oh, well, Robert! Well, Robert. Robert. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you bring Robert. me any guns? <laughs> it's oh. so good to see you. You look fine. Oh, Robert, you. I've been so worried. We expected you in on leave last night. Sit down and have some breakfast. There's muffins and the war's over. Isn't it wonderful? <laughs> mm, it is wonderful, and I'm starved. <laughs> did you get wounded any place? No. <laughs> oh. Uh, did you want your brother to get wounded? Everybody I know has a wounded brother but me. Well, I'm glad I can't accommodate you. Now sit down and have some breakfast, my son. Sit down. <laughs> We're going to the theater tonight, Robert. Would you like to go? Oh, I, I don't think so. Thank you, Mother. I think I'd just like to sit around and enjoy being home tonight. If anyone asks me, that is what I'd say. When you're bigger, we'll ask you. Well, I'd, be, I'd better be getting back to my desk. Speaker Colfax is coming over this morning to discuss government policy and Congressman Cole from California and John Creswell and... Mm, Father, why do they call it Good Friday? Why, it's the day that Christ was crucified, son. Well, why do they call it good? Because Christ was good. Well, it wasn't a good Friday. It was a bad Friday. Uh, son, I, uh, I don't have the time to talk about, to you about it now. Uh, but uh, you and I will have a talk uh, in the morning, shall we? I'll be glad it was tomorrow. Why? I don't like today. You mean you don't like this day or you don't like Good Friday? I don't know which it is, but, but it isn't a good day. It's a bad day. Son. It's a bad well, day. Well, son, don't talk like that. <laughs> yeah, I wonder why you should feel that way, my boy. You didn't feel that way until I came in, did you? No. I know what it is. I've heard men talk like that at the front just before a battle. It's a sudden feeling of death in the air. It's because I've come back from the front. Theodore, come on. Let you and I go see to your fruit stand. Yes, sir. You'll forget all about it in a few minutes. It's not you, Robert. I know it isn't you. It's Good Friday. Come on, dear. Go with your mother, son. Yes, sir. That's strange. Don't worry about it. He's pretty sensitive in the combination of Good Friday and me coming back. And I'll have to talk to him about Easter the first minute I can. I... I don't think he understands it at all. Dear, hmm? do you mind terribly if we don't go to see Aladdin? Oh, I thought you wanted to see Aladdin. Well, Laura Keene is playing in Our American Cousin, and it's a benefit as well as her last appearance there, and I thought it might be nice if we went to see her. Well, why not, if that's what you'd enjoy, my dear? All right. I'll send word to the theater. Robert, you go ahead with your breakfast. I'm going to the war department. All right. Uh, uh, you take a look at your brother after a while and see if he's all right, will you? Sure. You'll find him in the Grand Corridor selling apples. Oh, sure. Doing what? Selling apples. What for? For money. He's going to make money selling apples? He thinks he is, but by the time he reimburses the White House kitchen for whatever he talked them out of, pays the carpenter for the use of the bench, and pays the government rent on the space in the corridor, he's not going to come out very well. <laughs> I'll see you this afternoon. Robert, I'm awfully glad you're home. Well, good morning, Mr. President. Good morning, Mr. Secretary. General, it's good to see you. How are you, sir? Tired, but healthy as a knot. Ah, I'm glad to hear it. You're looking well. Victory becomes you. Thank you, sir. You seem in unusual <laughs> spirits today, Mr. President. Yes, yes. Sit down, gentlemen. Sit down. I woke up feeling genuinely happy for the first time in years. You know something? We're going to receive good news today, Stanton. And Stanton, last night I had that dream again. Oh, did you, Mr. President? Mm -hmm. What dream was that, sir? Well, I've, I've dreamt it before every one of the important events of the war... I dream that I'm on a strange ship, a singular, indescribable vessel, and that I'm, I'm moving towards a dark, indefinite shore. And every time I dream it, victory follows. Isn't that right, Mr. Secretary? 
Well, that's what you say, Mr. President. I have no way of verifying your dreams. Uh, By the way, General, my wife tells me she's invited you and your wife to the theater with us tonight. Mr. President, you can't go to the theater tonight. Why not? It's not safe. Oh, nonsense. Why, if you and the general attended, it would be an admirable time for an assassin to kill both of you. Oh, you're an alarmist, Stanton, isn't he, General? I'm afraid I'm on the secretary's side in this, Mr. President. I think it would be most unwise for you to make a public appearance at this time. Oh, I make public appearances every day and nobody's shot me yet. You're getting to be a terrible nuisance, Stanton. For three years, every time I step out, cavalry, foot guards, plain clothes, attendants spring from everywhere. I can't even go to the office alone. It's one of the penalties of being president. Oh, it's a lot of nonsense. Well, sir, in any case, I couldn't accompany you because I'm starting for home this afternoon to see my children. It's been a long time since I've seen... I understand. Please take them, my good wishes. Well, why don't you stay home and have a nice evening with your family, Mr. President? Because I am going to the theater. I want a little relaxation. I'll take Eckert with me. Now, sir... Did you know Eckert can break a poker over his arm, Mr. Secretary? Mr. President, whether Eckert can break a poker over his arm or not is completely outside the point. Oh, no, it isn't. No assassin would dare touch me with Eckert along. Eckert will be working with me tonight here at the War Department. Mr. Secretary... I'll wager that you're the kind of a man that goes to a zoo and doesn't take any peanuts. Whatever you may think of me, Mr. President, Eckert will still be working tonight. Very well, Mr. Secretary. I'll take Major Rathbun along. He isn't under your jurisdiction. Oh, Mr. President, if you'd only listen... Oh, smile, Mr. Secretary. The war is over. Peace is at hand. Surely even the President of the United States is entitled to one evening of relaxation. But he doesn't have to go to the theater for it. No, sir. I am going to the theater. My wife's going to get dressed up in her prettiest gown, and we're going to forget there was such a thing as a war for one whole evening. I tell you, today is my day, Stanton. From beginning to end, it's my day. Uh, Very well, Mr. President. You will see that Major Rathman receives my invitation. Yes, I'll see that he receives it. Good. Come, General, it's time for the cabinet meeting. Yes, Mr. President. Uh, It does me good to get the best of you once in a while, Mr. Secretary. There's nothing I enjoy more than to win an argument with you. I hope you have won this argument, Mr. President. I sincerely hope you've won it. just a moment, we'll come back to Edward Arnold and Mr. President. You know, it's been said that youth is too good to be wasted on the young. Well, that point is, of course, a moot one, but it is a fact that youth is too good to be wasted on tuberculosis, which took nearly 50,000 victims last year alone. 50,000 wasted lives is tragic. But the real tragedy lies in the fact that these deaths were unnecessary because tuberculosis can be cured if detected in time. Now, in the early stages, TB frequently has no symptoms, but its presence is easily detected with a chest X-ray. In some places, you can get a chest X-ray free or at a nominal cost through your local tuberculosis association or health department. To be sure that you're not one of the over half million people in the United States estimated to have TB, to protect yourself, to protect your family, have a chest X-ray taken as soon as possible. And now back to Edward Arnold and Mr. President. You've probably guessed the name of the president in this story. Later on, of course, I'll tell you which one it was. After the cabinet meeting, the president had his lunch, and the excited voices of the people jubilantly crowding the streets of Washington lifted inside him. It was their day, and it was his. God was in his heaven, and all was right with the Union. After lunch, he started for his office. Would you like to buy an apple, sir? Uh, Oh, hello, son. Yes, I think an apple is just what I need to polish off my lunch. Tell me, how's business? Oh, here you are. Five cents, please. Well, I have it right here. Business is slow this afternoon. Most everyone is going to church. Yes, of course, of course. Oh, that reminds me. I must think about some sort of an Easter message. Father, why was Christ crucified? Well, because there were people who hated him, son. People who didn't understand what he was trying to do. Bad people? Do you know what Christ said about them as he was dying? 
He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And this was the day it happened? Yes. This was the day it happened. Well, could he have saved himself? Yes. Well, why didn't he? Because he wanted to show you and me and all the people before us and after us that death was not an end, that we, we should not be afraid. Well, I'm afraid today, Father. Of what, my boy? Well, I don't know. Could I sleep with you tonight? Of course, of course. Do you have to go to the theater? No, don't you start on me. Well, I'm lonesome for you. But how could you be lonesome for me when I'm right here? Well, I know, but I'm still lonesome for you. Son, I don't quite understand what's wrong with you today. I don't know what to say to you. Oh, here you are. This is the hardest house to find anyone in. Dear, I wondered if you wanted to take anyone else on our drive this afternoon. You have so many old friends in town. Oh, no. Let you and I go by ourselves this afternoon. Uh, Mary, mm -hmm. uh, what do you think about the theater party? Do you still want to go? Well, dear, it's been announced that you'll be there now, and I think they've planned some special ceremony. Oh, then of course we'll go. I wouldn't want to disappoint the people. I thought you wanted to go. Well, I did, but Robert's come home when the little fellow was upset. Well, it's been announced, and we'll go. I'd better get to my office. The carriage will be ready late this afternoon. Good, I'll enjoy a ride. This time of year, it's nice to get out into the country. Oh, oh, oh. Who's that? Why are you stopping, dear? Oh, it's so beautiful out here today. You know, Mary, it's good to be alive and to have you and the boys in a land like this to live in. Mary, as soon as these four years are over, let's find ourselves a farm on the banks of the Sangamon. And I'll, I'll take up my law practice again. Would you like that? I'd love it. And you and I will go to the country dances and show our children a thing or two, and I'll kiss you in the moonlight on the way home, mm -hmm. just as just as though we were courting all over again, huh? Oh, my dear, I love you so. Maybe the last few years I haven't said it as often as I felt it, but I respect you and honor you and love you with my whole heart. And to have you to myself again. My dear, if it only happens... It's going to happen, my dear. We're going to settle down and live happily ever after. You and I and the children. You know, I've only seen you this joyous once before in my whole life. <laughs> the night before we were married? No. The night before our son William died. Mary. It's almost frightening to see you like this. As though someone thought... Let him be very happy today. Let him laugh. So that he'll be able to take the tears that will come tomorrow. Mary. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say that. I, I, I've been thinking it all day. You and the boy. It, it's foolish of me. <laughs> come on, dear. We better start back. You still have some more interviews and another trip to the war department to make before we can go to the theater. All right, Mary. All right. Come on, boy. Hey. It's an exciting day, isn't it, Mr. President? Yes, it is indeed, Mr. Crook. I'm sorry you have to walk along with me. I'm, I'm sure you'd like to be celebrating. Well, I'll celebrate later, sir. You know, I've been doing a lot of thinking today. I'm always joking with Stanton about all this mythical assailant and... Uh, but I believe there are men who want to take my life. And I have no doubt they'll do it. Well, this isn't like you, Mr. President. And it would be easy to do this very minute. Someone could shoot from a window or from around the corner. If anything happened to you, sir, it'd be the end of the country. Oh, oh. Don't you think it for one minute. This country isn't dependent on any one man. It isn't the leader that makes the country. It's the country that makes the leader. It isn't the man that makes the office of president. It's the office of president that makes the man. I am what the majority of the American people who elected me want me to be. When someone else takes my place, he'll be what the majority want him to be, or he won't be president very long. But still, sir, a man must have the, the makings of a president in him. Well, if a man is a good American, then he has the makings of a president. 
Oh, no, my friend. The loss of a single man can never hurt this nation. It will always put another man in office and go on. The nation may grieve. It may have a sense of loss. But it will go on. Well, sir, we'll hope that it won't have to go on without you. You know, Crook, I love this land of mine. I love our voices, the voices of the storms and the winds, the voice of the hammer and the saw, the voice of the railroad splitting the prairie with the challenge of civilization, the voice of the people arguing and growing by their arguments, learning more and more every day what freedom means and liberty. I hope I shall be listening to them for a long time yet. Don't misunderstand me. I, I have perfect confidence in every one of you men around me. I know no one could kill me and escape alive. But if it is to be done, it is impossible to prevent it. What is to be, will be. Isn't that right, Brooke? I don't know, sir. I know. What is to be, will be. Madam President, I'm sure you're the grandest lady in Washington tonight. Turn around and let me view the other extremity of that gown. Do you like it? I'm overpowered by your elegance. <laughs> Come on, Mr. President. We don't want to miss the curtain. All right, I'm ready, I'm ready. Where are your gloves? Hmm, what gloves? Oh, they're in my pocket. Well? Uh, Mary, do I have to put them on? They're so uncomfortable. You're the president, dear. Oh, well, I never would have run for officers. I'd known I'd have to wear gloves. <laughs> Well, you can put them on just before we get to the theater. The carriage is waiting. Oh, it's a fine evening. Yes, yeah, be careful of your dress, my dear. Oh, good evening, Major Rathman. Here, my dear, let me help you in. Thank you. Oh, how do you do, Major Rathman? It's so nice to have you with us. Father! 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 Excuse me, my dear. <laughs> Tell me, what is the matter, son? What is I it? I found out what Good Friday's about. I found out what Easter's oh, about. Oh, now, now, now. Here, here. Tell me, what is it about, son? It's about death. They buried him, and they sealed him in the tomb. It's about death. No, 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 son. It isn't about death. You've missed the whole point. It isn't about death. It's about resurrection. Do you have to go to the theater? Yes, of course I do. You know that. But I'll see you when I get home. Maybe I'll wake you up, and you and I will have a glass of milk together, huh? Would you like that? Good Friday will be over then. Yes, Father. So run along up to bed. Good night, son. Goodbye, Father. <laughs> Goodbye, Father. Goodbye. Well, you've probably figured out by now who the president was when all that happened. It really did happen, you know, and you'll have the answer in just a moment. During the time the greatest story ever told has been on the air, it has won numerous awards from leading church authorities, critics, and newspapers. But some of the most memorable tributes to this Sunday evening program have been from the listeners themselves. Many of the letters people have written have been letters of appreciation, both to the sponsor and ABC, for dramatizing the powerful, inspiring story of the man who led the greatest life ever lived. Through the years, his messages and teachings have stood out like a beacon, giving courage and inspiration to millions. So listen today and every Sunday for the greatest story ever told when it's heard over the same ABC stations. And now back to Edward Arnold and Mr. President. <laughs> you enjoy the play, Major Rathbun and Miss Harris? I'm sure we will. We had originally planned to go to Grover's Theatre, but Mary thought as long as it was Miss Keene's closing performance, we should go to Ford's. Well, it's supposed to be a very worthwhile evening. I, 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 here we are, here we are. Oh, look at all the people. Put on your gloves, dear. Uh, yes, Mary, yes. Uh, come, ladies, let me help you out. I'm sure this will be a memorable evening for all of us. Uh, right this way, sir. Your box is ready for you. Mr. Lincoln. Be 
with us again next week, won't you, for another interesting story that happened in Washington a few years ago to Mr. President. Until then, goodbye. This program is produced and directed by Dick Woolen. Edward Arnold can currently be seen in the MGM picture, The Yellow Cabman. Mr. President was created by Robert G. Jennings. Today's story was based on incidents in the life of President Abraham Lincoln. Be sure to listen again next week when the American Broadcasting Company and its affiliated stations bring you Edward Arnold with another interesting and factual story of Mr. President. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Adventures by Morse. Carlton E. Morse presents... The City of the Dead, featuring Captain Friday. If you like high adventure, come with me. If you like the stealth of intrigue, come with me. If you like blood and thunder, come with me. Two o'clock on the morning of the third day in the City of the Dead. Three nights and two days have been spent in this old abandoned cemetery. This is the morning of the third day. But let Captain Friday tell you. At midnight, we were asleep in the cottage of my father, Mayor Friday, who's caretaker of the old cemetery. Then there came the disturbing wails of the old clawfoot phantom. I got up and with Jimmy Parker went out into the night. Almost immediately, we stumbled onto a trail of bones that led us among the tombstones down into the city of the dead. It led to a grave upon whose headstone had been placed a skull. It was a freshly opened grave and there was a man down in it digging. So much for that. In the meantime, Dr. Tuner had been left at the cottage with Phyllis Carroll, kept to bed by her knife wound. Also, the old mare was supposedly asleep in one of the bedrooms, locked in by Captain Friday, so that he would not be disturbed. Dr. Tuner became frightened when old Clawfoot began to prowl outside the door and broke into Mayor Friday's room, only to find that he was not in the locked room at all. And then the Clawfoot creature took measure in his own hands. He broke into the front door, overwhelmed Dr. Tuner and came to the bed beside the girl. When it reached toward her, she cried out and lost consciousness. It is now two in the morning, and we are down in the city of the dead, where Captain Friday and Jimmy Parker are watching the ghoul at work in the grave. The grave of old Ernie Morton. Get down, Parker. Down on your face and keep still. Did you see who it was digging in the grave, Captain? Keep still, I tell you. Not a move out of you. Don't even raise your head to look. Why so mysterious? Who is it? Never mind. You do as I say. Keep down here behind this tombstone. Here, where are you going? Keep still. Now listen, I'm going to sneak out alone. Yeah, help Be us. quiet. I'm going out alone because it'll make less noise. He's down in the grave now. I want to catch him red-handed. Well, I think that's a fool idea. Let me go along. You do what I tell you, Parker. Yeah, but he'll be desperate. He's liable to be the killer. I can take care of myself. Now mind you, do what I say. Don't move a muscle until you hear me yell. I'll yell when I jump him. Uh, I don't like it. That doesn't make any difference. Remember now, wait until I yell. Here? 
Oh, Jimmy, what's happened to you? What? Oh, Jimmy. Oh, Jimmy. Phyllis. Why, Phyllis, what's happened? What's been going on oh, here? Where have you been? Why have you been gone so long? Why are you so white? What's happened? Nothing. Nothing that matters now. Tell me, what's been going on here? Where's Doc Tuner? He's over there behind those overturned chairs. Jimmy, he's dead. Dead? Jimmy, the clawfoot phantom's been here. Phyllis. Dr. Tuner tried to drive him out, and, and the thing killed him. Phyllis, are you sure Dr. Tuner's dead? Oh, please don't leave me. I'm not going to leave you. I want to see if there's anything I can do for the doctor. I know he's dead, Jimmy. I, I saw him fall. No. No, he's not, Phil. No, he's not dead. He's still breathing. Oh, I'm glad. I'm glad. No, wait. I'll get him on the lounge. I don't think he's very badly hurt. There. There. Looks to me like he's just been knocked down. Oh, that's wonderful. What a fight there must have been. This place is a wreck. Everything upside down. Yes, it, it was pretty bad. And what happened after old Clawfoot knocked the doctor out? It turned on me. It made a little mewing wail. I never felt so awful in my life. You and whale. Phyllis, what are you saying? It was just like that, Jimmy. Just as though it was an animal that was glad to see me. Oh, for goodness sake. It crept toward me, wailing a little soft wail. Oh, Jimmy, I can't tell you how terrible it was. It just kept coming closer and closer. And you couldn't move. I screamed at it to go away. I begged it not to come near me, but it kept coming on and on. And then suddenly it was over me. It stretched out a lean claw hand. Oh, and Phil, I, dear. And then I fainted. Ah, oh, you poor kid. I thought you'd be safe here. I'd never let you. I just came to. Just a moment before you came in. The thing was gone. I wish I knew what to do about Doc Tuna there. You're certain he isn't dying? No, he's not dying. Just a bump on the head. He'll be around presently. Hey. Hey, where's Mayor Friday? Who broke open his door? I forgot all about him. We, we don't know. What do you mean you don't know? We don't know what's become of him. When old Clawfoot began to wail outside, Dr. Tuner broke in the door to awaken him. But the mayor wasn't any place in the room. Yeah, but that's silly, Phil. We saw Captain Friday lock his father in. He wasn't there. He vanished. Vanished from a barred and locked room? And I've got to lie here in this miserable bed with my shoulder hurt. Oh, what if something should come after me? I couldn't run. I couldn't do anything. Hey, don't you worry about that, Phil. I'm not moving from your side from now on. But, but what about you? You were so white when you came in. Something's happened. Why don't you tell me? I... Well, what do you mean, Phil? You're holding something back. What happened out there in the city of the dead? Why were you so white when you ran into the house? Where's Captain Friday? I... Well, Phyllis... Has... Has something happened to the captain? Now, Phyllis, you've got enough to worry about. Don't bother your head about it. It's Dr. Tuner. Yeah, still He's unconscious. Growing. He's still unconscious, but he'll be around pretty soon now. Oh, Jimmy Parker, you tell me what happened. You've got to tell me. Is he dead? Is Captain Friday dead? No. Well, that is, I don't know. You don't know? Well, weren't you with him all the time? Oh, Jimmy, don't put me off. I'm not putting you off, Phyllis. Honestly, I don't know. Then... Phil, Captain Friday's vanished. <gasps> vanished? Captain Friday's vanished. Oh, Jimmy. Now, now, Phyllis, don't give way. Please don't. Oh, but... But first the mayor disappeared, and... And now his son. Jimmy, do you think we're to be next? Of course not. But think of what's happened. First it was my cousin, Bert Arnold. They strangled him and threw him in an old grave. Oh, don't talk about it, Phil. It'll only make you feel worse. And then that stranger was stabbed to death outside your window. Well, we know old Clawfoot did that. We saw him. And, and and then, then Lammy Fink, frightened to death. What is there in the world that could frighten a person to death? Well, that old caretaker was always scared of a cemetery at night, you know that. But what a horrible way to die. I've heard that a person's heart sometimes bursts wide open with fear. Did you ever hear of that, Jimmy? No, of course not. Stop it now, Phil. You're frightening yourself sick with this kind of talk. And then Mayor Friday vanished from a barred room. Oh, Phil, I tell you... And now Captain Friday. Tell me, Jimmy... How did Captain Friday disappear? How did it happen? It... Oh, listen here, Phil. Wait until morning, won't you? Wait until daylight and I'll tell you all about it. It'll only be a few hours now. No, no, I want to hear now. But, but Phyllis, it's not a nice story. Tell me now. 
Well, I left the house and went to the shed where we laid out the skeleton. The skeleton with the message tied to it? Saying it wasn't my grandfather? Oh, Phil, I wish you wouldn't. Go on, Jimmy. Well, well, the skeleton was gone. Gone? The skeleton, too. The mayor, the captain, and now the skeleton. Yes, the skeleton was gone. We were looking about outside the shed when I ran across the bones of its foot. Its foot? Yes. Just a little further down into the city of the dead, and Captain Friday found its ankle bone. What? Oh, well, that's strange. What did that mean? We didn't know at first. But presently we found leg bones and most of the rest of the skeleton scattered out ahead of us. It was a trail of bones, Phyllis. A trail of bones? Yes, a trail of bones leading us down into the city of the dead. Leading us down to a grave. And he... Any particular grave? The grave of Ernie Morton. Ernie Morton? The grave we opened in search of the black pearls. Oh, Jimmy. The grave in which the strangled body of your cousin, Bert Arnold, was found. Oh, what does it mean? What is it? And Phil, oh. when we got down into the city of the dead, there perched on the headstone of Ernie Morton's grave was the grinning skull of our skeleton. Oh. And that isn't all. Yes? Phyllis, there was someone digging in that grave again. Jimmy. Yes, someone digging. Digging. He didn't see us. We threw ourselves down in the shadow of a tombstone. It was brilliant moonlight. Who? Who was it? I couldn't tell. I don't know. Captain Friday made me lie flat. I couldn't see a thing. All I could hear was the shoveling. Shoveling of the ghoul in Ernie Morton's grave. Then what happened? Captain Friday was peering around the edge of the tombstone. Suddenly he called my name and dropped back to the ground. He saw who it was? That's what I thought, but if he did, he wouldn't tell me. He said he was going out after the fellow and that I was to lie still until he yelled. He said he would yell when he leaped into the grave on the man. And that was my signal to come to his aid. Why didn't you go with him? Well, I wanted to, but he wouldn't let me. He wouldn't even let me raise my head to watch him while he sneaked up on the grave. Why? I don't know. Then he slipped out and I waited. I waited and waited. Pretty soon I heard the shoveling stop. I got ready to jump to my feet. I expected the captain to yell any second, but there wasn't any yell. I waited a few seconds longer, and then I raised myself and looked over the top of the gravestone. Yes, Jimmy? Phyllis, there wasn't a sign of anyone any place around. Jimmy! It's as true as anything I ever said in my life. Captain Friday had vanished. The gravedigger had vanished. Even the shovel had gone. I rushed to the edge of the half-uncovered grave and looked everywhere. There was nothing. Oh, Jimmy, I couldn't have done that. I stood there in the moonlight at the edge of the grave, petrified for a moment. Then I yelled until my lungs hurt. And all I got from my trouble was a lot of echoes. Echoes coming up from the ruins of the old church. Echoes and the faint sounding of that phantom church bell. I couldn't have stood it. Then I got sick. And I got away from the edge of the grave and started to run. It's more than a mile, but I ran the whole way back here to the cottage without stopping. No wonder you were white and out of breath. And when I came in the door and found everything so upset and you so frightened, it brought me to my senses. Mm. I think the doctor's coming too, Phyllis. Get a pan of cold water, Jimmy. Baby's head. Yeah, Okay. Watch him, Phil. If he starts to move around, yell. I don't want him to fall off the lounge. He's all right. Only hurry. Coming. Now I'll fix him up. Poor old guy. Now, this cold water will help that head. You know, Phil, this is pretty rough treatment for a man as old as Doc Tuner. It's pretty rough treatment on any of us. And Jimmy, just as sure as anything in this world, this is building up to something. Yeah. I suppose everything has a payoff. I, I just hope that payoff won't, won't end up in a funeral parlor. That's all I hope. The old mayor missing, Captain Friday missing. And the prowling of old Clawfoot is building up to something more surely than Phyllis Carroll can know. And on the next appearance of one of these three who is even now making his way between the moonlit headstones toward the cottage. But more of that in just a moment. Oh, oh my head. Oh, he's coming too, all right, Phil. I'm awfully sorry about him. He's been so kind to me. Oh, my head. The mayor keeps some stimulant around here somewhere. I think a little something would do him good. I saw it on the lower left-hand shelf in the kitchen cupboard, Jimmy. Oh, good. I'll get it. <coughs> uh, did you find it, Jimmy? Yeah, I got it. Yeah, this will snap him out of it. Here now, Doc. Try and drink this. <coughs> oh, 
That's put color in his face. He's opening his eyes, Phil. Hello, Doc. Feeling pretty bad? What, what is it? What's the matter? Just a little bump on the head, Doctor. You'll be all right in a minute. Bump on the head? How did I get a bump on the head? Oh, don't remember, huh? Old Clawfoot slugged you. Clawfoot. Clawfoot, I remember. He was after Miss Carroll. Did he get her? I'm did all... he get her? I'm all right, Dr. Tuner. Honest, I am. Don't you worry about me a bit. Oh, I shouldn't have let that thing get the best of me. I guess I ain't as young as I used to be. Well, don't you worry about that. You put up a good fight. Phyllis told me all about it. I'm still a good fighting man, Parker. I'd have brained that thing with the poker if my foot hadn't slipped. That's what was the matter. My foot slipped. Yeah, of course, Dr. Tuner. That's the way it happened. Now, you just lay back and rest a while. Jim Parker. Well? You know, I'm feeling kind of dejected like I think I could do with another spoonful out of that bottle. Oh, that's right, sir. I'll bet you could. In just a minute, I'll fix it for you. Here you are. <coughs> Thanks, Parker. Yeah, that's all right. Mm. Now, you just lie still for a bit until you feel stronger. Jimmy, could I have a drink of water? Oh, sure thing. Now, I'll have it for you in a jiffy. Here you are, Phil. Hey, where's Captain Friday, Parker? He hasn't come in yet. What's he doing out meandering around the city of the dead this time of night? Oh, he'll be in when he gets ready. What gets me is what that old clawfoot critter wanted in here. I reckon he didn't come from Miss Carroll after all, seeing as he went away without hurting her none. Did you see what he did after I was knocked out, Miss Carroll? No, Dr. Tuner. He came toward me and I fainted. Oh, fainted, huh? Yes, and... He was gone when I came to. And you ain't noticed anything different since you waked up? Anything about the room or anything in the room? Why, no. Funny. What do you suppose he wanted, Parker? I don't suppose he wanted anything. Probably the midnight ramblings of a mad creature. I think you and Phil were lucky to get off with your lives. <gasps> Listen. The phantom church bell again. I wonder if it's going to begin all over. Begin over again? What do you mean? I mean, I wonder if we're going to have more trouble with old Clawfoot tonight. Oh, oh Jimmy, would you please look out of the window and see if anything's outside? No, of course, Phyllis. Hey, Dr. Tuna, what are you doing? You lie down there. No, sir. I reckon I'm feeling a much sprayer than I did. I guess I'll be moving about a bit. Yeah, but you had a nasty blow on the head. Well, you don't want me to stay in bed the rest of my life just because you bumped my head, do you, Parker? No, of course not. Not if you feel like getting up. There goes the bell again. Oh, please look out of the window and see if that... that thing is around again. I don't suppose I'll be able to see much. Shh. Someone on the porch. Listen to that. Yeah, someone on the porch. Listen. Shh. He's coming up to the door. Is it bolted? Yes, I locked it. I don't want it to come in here. I couldn't stand seeing it again. Shh, Phil. Doc and I can take care of you. I wouldn't mind having a gun. Yeah, that's what I wished for on his last visit. Here. You take the leg of this broken chair. I'll handle the poker. Shh, shh. Hello! Who's there? In mean disposition, whoever he is. Oh, Jimmy, I'm so afraid. Hi, you out there! You better answer if you know what's good for you. That's right. We're two against you. You ain't got a chance. Dr. Tuner. Dr. Tuner, is that you? Mr. Mayor Friday, will that be... Sure, it's me, Mayor. Here, unlock that door and let the mayor in. Dr. Tuner, are you certain it's the mayor? Certain? Of course I'm certain. Go on, open the door, Parker. Yeah, what did I tell you? Of course it's the mayor. Well, why shouldn't it be me? What in tarnation you going to lock me out for? Well, why didn't you answer instead of tromping up on the porch and banging on the door without a word? Because I ain't used to asking for permission to enter my own house. Hmm. What in the Sam Hills happened here, anyway? Who broke that chair? Who smashed in that door? I reckon it couldn't be helped, Mayor. We had a little visit from old Clawfoot while you were out. Clawfoot? I reckon so. By the way, Mayor Friday, where have you been all night? Curious, young squirt, ain't you, Parker? Perhaps so. But a lot of things have been happening around the City of the Dead tonight. And I think you can throw light on a great deal of it. What's been happening? Well, to begin with, we all saw Captain Friday lock you in that room there before he and I went out into the City of the Dead. You saw the captain lock me in? That's right, Mayor. I reckon we all saw him do it. Doc, you saw him lock me in? I reckon that's right, Mayor. When was that, Doc? 
Just before he and young Parker here went out. I reckon it was something about like midnight, Mayor. Oh. How'd you get out, Mayor Friday? Where's the captain, Parker? Why? Why, he vanished. Vanished? Yes. We went down into the city of the dead together and, well, he disappeared. You, you mean something's happened to my son, Parker? I'm sorry, Mayor Friday. I don't know what happened to him. You see, we found someone digging in Ernie Morton's grave. Ernie Morton's grave? Yes. Captain Friday made me lie down behind a tombstone while he crept up to the grave. He told me to wait until he shouted. Well? He never shouted. Didn't shout? No. I waited as long as I thought it wise, and then I followed. What did you see? Nothing. Captain Friday had vanished, and so had the fellow that had been digging. Did you see who it was in that grave? No. When I got to the edge of the grave, there was nothing but a partly filled hole. That's a likely story, young man. Well, it's true. Yeah, I reckon I know better than that. Well, well, what do you mean? Just what I say. It just happens that I came up through the city of the dead right by Ernie Morton's grave not half an hour ago, and that grave ain't been touched. Maybe, though, you filled up the grave before you came in. No. No, I left it just as it was. You say it's filled up now? Reckon it ain't been opened this night. Well, I tell you, it was open. And I tell you, Parker, if you killed my son, it's going to be the last sneaking thing you do. That's the most asinine statement I ever heard. No, oh, another country heard from. Phyllis is right. It is asinine. Now, now, look here, Mayor. Are you certain Ernie Morton's grave hasn't been dug into? I'll take you down there if you can't take my word for no, it. No, no. If you say so, Mayor, it's so. But look here. Parker ain't been acting like my idea of a killer. You're an old fool, Doc Tuner. How do you know how a killer acts? Now then, Mayor, you can't make me believe that you think the captain's dead. I ain't lived around you 40 years for nothing. If you really thought anything had happened to that you boy... Keep you keep your thoughts to yourself, Doc Tuner. But, Mayor Friday, why would Jimmy do a thing like that? He hadn't any reason. Honestly, he didn't. The captain was getting too much on him. Of course he had reason. Plenty of reason. Oh, no, no. Honestly, Jimmy wouldn't hurt anyone. Honestly. Yeah, there now, Miss Carol. <laughs> oh, Phil, don't cry. It's all right. Oh, but you didn't. <laughs> now, now, Miss Carol, you've gone and made yourself unhappy again. You've had too much trouble tonight. Oh, but Dr. Tuner, you you know Jimmy wouldn't hurt anybody, don't you? Why, yes, yes, of course. Here, now, you let me straighten out your pillow for you. But the mayor said... Yeah, there, there, now. Let me lift you up a little. Yeah, now I can fix that pillow. I'll give you a powder that'll put... Hello. What's this under your pillow? Why, I don't know. Look. Look here, Mayor, Parker, look. Look what I found under Miss Carol's pillow. What is it? Let me see. What have you got there, Dr. Tuner? A black pearl. A black pearl. Jumping Jerusalem. Did you ever see anything like it? A black pearl as big as a pigeon's egg. But where did it come from? Dr. Tuner, where did you get it? I found it under Miss Carol's pillow, just where I said I found it. Phil, where did you get it? I, I don't know. It isn't mine. I never saw it before. But it was under your pillow, young woman. I don't care. I never saw it before. Ain't it a beauty? One of old Theodore Beverly's collection, as sure as you're born. But, but it's uncanny. How did it get under my pillow? Well, one thing's certain now, anyway. What's that, son? That somebody has found the pearls. Their whereabouts is no longer a secret to somebody. And to someone in this group. How do you figure that out, Mayor? Because we're the only ones who've had an opportunity of placing the pearl under the girl's pillow. Old Clawfoot. It was Old Clawfoot. My jiggers, I wonder. Of course it was Old Clawfoot. We were wondering why he broke into the place. He didn't take anything, didn't hurt anyone more than was necessary to carry out his mission. Sounds reasonable. Well, of course. If Phyllis hadn't fainted, I'll bet he'd have put the pearl right in her hand. Jimmy, do you really think so? I'll bet money on it. But why? Why? I don't know. Just the same, I'll bet it was he. I know it was. You seem awful anxious to convince us, Parker. What? What do you mean, Mayor? I mean, I don't think Clawfoot had anything to do with that pearl. Oh? Well, what's your theory? I think you put that pearl there. What? Me? Yes. I think that pearl explains why the captain didn't come back to the cottage with you, James Parker. But I don't understand. Oh, yes, you do. In some manner, you and my son hid on the hiding place of them black pearls tonight. And it didn't suit your purpose to have anybody but yourself know about them. You're crazy. Well, maybe I am and maybe I ain't. But just the same, young fella, I ain't taking any chances. You're going in that there bedroom of yours, and you're going to stay there until we can turn you over to the police. But you can't do that. You mustn't. Look here, Mayor, that's absurd. Why on earth would I give myself away by bringing one of the pearls here to the cottage? You couldn't resist the temptation of bringing one along to show to the girl. 
Likely you and her was a-looking at it when Doc Tuner came to. You didn't have time to hide it, so you stuck it under her pillow. No, no, I never saw it before. Honestly, I didn't. I swear it. Now, now, don't you go getting all excited again, Miss Carroll. What's the matter with you, Mayor Friday? Why don't you give me a break? You're always making me the goat for everything. What have you got against me? I've never done anything to you. That won't do you no good, Parker. Well, you know what I think of you. With as much circumstantial evidence against you. Circumstantial evidence? I'd like to know if there's anyone in the world that's got more against them than you. You went out of this house with my son, and you came back alone. That's enough for me. Look! Look! What? What? Are you pointing at me? Yes, I'm pointing at you. Look there in his vest pocket. Jimmy, what is it? I don't see anything. Must be losing his mind. What's the matter with you? Look at that gold pencil in his vest pocket. That's Captain Friday's pencil. (gasps) You... You mean... Captain Friday had that pencil in his pocket when we left the house tonight. What? What's that? And look at the fresh dirt on the knee of the mayor's trousers. Oh, Jimmy. Mayor Friday, supposing you tell us what's become of your son, Captain Friday. There have been many clues pointing to old Mayor Friday of the City of the Dead all along. But now, had he finally hanged himself? And was it Clawfoot who left the Black Pearl for Phyllis? Not only these questions, but the whereabouts of Captain Friday will be brought to you next week when Carlton E. Morse presents Chapter 8 of The City of the Dead, entitled The Kidnapping of Clawfoot. NBC brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to robbery detail. A ruthless fiend roams the streets of your city masquerading as a police officer. For months, helpless citizens have been robbed, beaten senseless, and kidnapped. The criminal is a twisted genius, vicious, Cunning. Your job is to get him. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime, investigated and solved by the men who unrelentingly stand watch on the security of your home, your family, and your life. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, From crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Wednesday, June 4th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of robbery detail. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Ed Backstrand, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. I was on my way back from communications, and it was 11.13 p.m. when I got to room 27A. Robbery detail. Oh, hi, Joe. Hi, Ben. Did you get that message to call home? Yeah, bad news. What's the matter? That doggone kid of mine, chicken pox. Oh, again? Last year it was the mumps. Year before that, the measles. Every time I get set for a vacation, he decides to catch something. Well, forget it, Ben. Think what a comfort he's going to be in your old age. Go ahead, laugh. You'll find out. Yeah. How are you, Friday? Romero? Fine. What can we do for you? You don't look like you remember me. Oh, no, wait a minute. Name's Savage, isn't it? George? It's Johnny, Sergeant. Johnny Savage. You remember now? Oh, sure. Those liquor store robbers out in the Wilshire District. About six, seven years ago, wasn't it? Ten years, Romero. You ought to remember that. You were at the trial. We testify in court every week. Ten years is a long time. It's longer in the state pen. It's a lot longer. Yeah, you cried a little at that trial, didn't you, Savage? You said we beat that confession out of you. Yeah, that's why I figured I'd drop in for a little visit. Uh, kind of apologize to you fellas. You gave me a square deal. I 
guess I kind of lost my head. I figured I'd apologize. Oh, that's all right, Savage. When'd you get out? A couple of weeks ago. I did it the hard way. Served ten flat. I don't know my day. You find a job yet? Yeah, Friday. I'm working nights. What kind of a job? Laborer in a warehouse, south end of town. Good. You decided to level? Ten years in prison's a long time. You learn a lot of things. Nights are long, you think a lot. You get things straightened out. I hope you mean that. Sure I mean it, Friday. I've got everything straightened out. I know who my friends are, and I know who to watch out for. You sound like maybe you're on the right track. I got a figure, Romero. And like you two fellas, you caught me red-handed and you sent me up for ten years. Well, you did all right, Savage. Five armed robberies, you got off pretty easy. You got a break, Savage. Make the best of it. Sure, I'm not kicking. Ten years, a real break. That's right. Well, <laughs> uh, just dropped in for a little visit. Maybe I'll see you fellas sometime. All right, Savage. Keep your nose clean. Sure. No hard feelings. No. You just took ten years of my life, that's all. There's no such thing as a man going through prison without changing. And Ben and I have seen him switch in both directions. Some men learn their lesson after they land behind bars, and when they're released, they turn into good citizens. Johnny Savage was sour. We made a mental note to check him out later on, and then we went down to the record bureau and pulled his coming out mug. That's about all that we had time for, because about an hour later, we started to get busy. Hot shot, Joe. Grab it. On the corner of Selma and Naples, the drugstore, 211 and probable attack. On the corner of Selma and Naples, 211 and... Pro- what you got, Joe? Selma and Naples, 211 and attack. Come on. Here we are, Joe. Walk around right the far corner. Yeah. All right. Come on. We got the story from the victim, the store owner, Mr. Thomas. For the most part, it was the usual rundown of an early morning holdup. There was only one exception. Oh, I've had young hoodlums try to hold me up before, but there was nothing like this one. How you mean, Mr. Thomas? Well, he came in here just before closing, and ordinarily I'd have kept an eye out because that's the time to look for him. But this fellow came to the door and said he was a policeman, so I let him in. He looked like a cop. Boyd's right up to me and the wife behind the counter and pointed a gun. And she screamed, and he hit her in the face with the butt of the gun. Sergeant, it, it was horrible, Remember? That's the way it started, and that's the way it kept going. Because most of the victims and most people don't realize that as a citizen, they have the right to check on police officers' identification when in doubt. After we got the story from Mr. Thomas and checked the store in the neighborhood, Ben and I headed back for the office. Attention, all units. At the end of North Baxter Road near Hillcrest, victim of 211 and slugging. Car 7172, take the call. Code 3. Attention, all That's units. four blocks away from the last one. Let's roll on it, huh, Ben? Right, I'll hit the siren. You get the light. By the time Ben and I got up to the end of North Baxter, the men from car 71 were already there. The victim was telling his story. His face looked like it had been through a meat grinder. I was just shifting the car into second to make the hill when I hear this siren behind me and I, I see this red light flashing in the side view mirror. Well, naturally, I pulled over to the curb and... I was just reaching for my driver's license when the cop runs up, yanks me out of the car and starts clubbing me in the face with the butt of his gun. Did you get a look at him? Think you can describe him? No, I'm afraid not. He swung me around and kept me staring into that red light on his car all the time he was beating me. After a while, everything just went black. When I woke up, my wallet was gone, all my money's... Forty-five minutes later, Ben and I were interviewing the third victim, a young housewife out in the Wilshire district. Same trademark. (laughs) I tried to tell him, Sergeant. I tried to tell him I didn't have any money, but he wouldn't listen. He kept holding me by the throat, beating me with his fist like he enjoyed it. Beating me. Beating me. Yeah, all right. All right, Mrs. Jameson. Could you tell us how he got in the house? He came in the front door and rang the bell. I opened the door, but I left the burglar chain on. He said he was a policeman. So when he demanded I open the door all the way, I did. Then he grabbed me. And you, can't describe the man for us, Miss Jameson? He was tall. And he had dark hair and big hands. It was like a nightmare. A horrible nightmare. 
Tall, dark hair, big hands. Your guess the same as mine, Joe? Maybe. Let's wait and see. Come on, let's check with the boss. Hi, Mike. Hi. He's waiting for you. In there. Come on, Ben. Chief of Detectives Office. Hannah. Sit down. Yeah, Skipper. All right, you two. Let's have it. The guy with the red light? Yes, the guy with the red light posing as a policeman. Why hasn't he been picked up? You know as much about it as we do, Ed. We got our first call around midnight. He knocked over a drugstore out on Selma. He hasn't stopped working since. Didn't you get any definite lead on him? No description? No license number? Nothing. He's tall, big hands, dark hair. That's all. Fine. Either of you got any ideas? Could be anybody, Skipper, with that description. You're sure it wasn't anybody on the force? We sent all the victims down to personnel. Lowry showed him the mug book of all police officers. Wasn't one of our men. Works fast. Drugstore, motorist, a pedestrian, a housewife out in the Wilshire district. Went right in the house after her. Four of them, right in a row. Five. Huh? There's a 20-year-old kid in the next room. Came in just before you got here. A couple of hours ago, he was sitting in a car with his girl up in Mulholland Drive. This red light bandit comes along, slugs him, and kidnaps the girl. Kidnapped? She still miss? Not a trace. When did this happen? A couple of hours ago, they brought the kid over from Georgia Street Hospital. We can talk to him now. He's had a bad time. Right in here. Okay. Pete, we're going to have to ask you a few more questions. Oh, yeah. Okay. It feels a little better now. This is Sergeant Friday and Sergeant Romero. Hi, Pete. Hi. Can you tell us what time the trouble started? Oh, about 10, 15, 10, 30. Sally and I were sitting in the car talking about where we were going on our honeymoon. We're going to be married next month. And then this car pulls up behind us and starts flashing a red spotlight on us and a guy runs over and pulls open the door. He said he was a cop. Did you get a good look at his car, Pete? I think it was a black sedan. Did you get a look at the man, Pete? No. No, I didn't. It was pretty dark and he kept me staring into that red spotlight. It all happened so fast. Then he started slugging me and I went down. What happened then? Well, the next thing I knew, Sally was screaming. He had one hand on her throat, and he had her backed up against the side of the car. He was beating her with the other hand. So, some kind of a short billy club. Now, well, I got up, and I started for him, and he slugged me again. When I came to, Sally was gone. Anybody check the area up there, Ed? Yeah, Davis and Griffin. Didn't find a thing. Oh, Sergeant, you gotta find it. You got to. I wouldn't know what to tell her folks. I, I wouldn't know what to say. That's all right, Pete. We'll find her. You take it easy. Got a hot shot, Ed, up in Summit Road near Westmore. A woman, unconscious, ambulance follow-up, possible dead body. Uh, all right, Hannon. Look after Pete here. Friday, Romero, let's go. Up ahead, Romero, to the right. Okay, Skip. Yeah, there's the ambulance and the cruiser car. You're a lonely-looking spot. All right, come on. Hiya, Doc. What'd you find? Hiya, fellas. Right over here. Just gonna take her in. Uh, where'd you find her? Over there, by the side of the road. Somebody driving by us saw her. They called us. Any identification? This bracelet on her wrist. Mm, to my dearest Sally and Pete. December 25th, 1947. That's a girl, all right. What are the chances, Doc? I wouldn't bet on them. Pretty bad shape. Well, have you seen enough? Yeah. Friday, Romero, call the crime lab and check the area for footprints and tire tracks. I'll ride back in the ambulance with the girl. If she regains consciousness, I want to talk to her. All right? Okay, Ed. I'll meet you in the office by 8.30. We're working straight through till we get this guy. See you at the office, Giver. What time you got, Ben? Seven minutes to four. Long night. Hey, that car up there ahead. Let's take a look at it, huh? Mm, black sedan. Hey, look, he's flashing a red spot on that convertible. Come on. He sees us, Joe. He's pulling away. Get that gas pedal down to the floor. Oh, already there. He's turning off right. Hit the siren. I'll get the light. We're gaining a little, Ben. Next corner to the left. Joe, where'd he go? He's a fancy driver. Try the alley up ahead to the left. Yeah. Must have turned up that cross street. Get through the alley and double back on him. Right. There he is, Ben. Look out. Watch it, Joe. Watch it. He's going to ram us. We got hit just in front of the rear bumper. Our car was forced into the curbing and it turned over. 
It was real lucky. He kept right on going. But this time, Ben and I were sharing the luck. All we got out of it was a couple of nasty cracks in the head and a few bruises, but it was enough to keep us in a hospital under observation for a day. By this time, Ed Backstrand was fuming. So were the newspapers. During the day we spent in the hospital, the red light bandit went on a real blitz. He pulled six more jobs, one liquor store, two residential holdups, and three car robberies. Five of the six victims were slugged and beaten. Davis and Griffin had taken over for Ben and me, and by the time we got back on the job, they'd built up a lead for us. We've been working with Wilkerson up in auto theft, Joe. He's used four stolen cars already. We got the makes and numbers on each one of them. How about the dark sedan he was driving when he rammed us? The boys picked it up this morning out on Sepulveda. We're checking it for prints now. Oh, that's fine, Dave. You got any description on the guy yet? No luck there, Joe. He works too fast. Nothing at all? The same as you had. Tall, black hair, big hands. Loves to use them. Friday, Romero, got a minute? Okay, Skipper. Check you later, honey. Sure thing, boys. Sit down. How do you feel? Pretty fair, Ed. A little stiff here and there. All right, did Davis fill you in? Up to date. Okay, I just called the doctor who's handling Sally Wilder, Pete's girlfriend. Do you remember? Oh, yeah. She's been in pretty bad shape since we found her up there on Summit Road. This morning she took a turn for the better. She's conscious, and her doctor thinks she might be able to talk to us a little bit. Good. When? About an hour. I cleared it with the doctor and with her family. You'll only be able to stay a couple of minutes and make the most of them. That's all. All right, Ed. We'll check with you later. Say, Joe, Ben, huh? here's some mail came for you fellas while you were gone. Oh, thank you, Mike. We're going over to the county hospital. We ought to be back in a couple hours. Okay. Say, there's been a couple of phone calls, too. Yeah, anything important? I don't think so. The guy just called to say hello. Said his name was Johnny Savage. Just call to say hello. I presume you men are aware of the girl's critical condition. Yeah, that's right, Dr. Froman. We saw her before she was taken here at the hospital. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, you understand, of course, that you'll be able to see her for only a few minutes, and please try your best not to excite her, huh? Right, Doctor. Sally isn't able to talk. Bad mouth and face injuries. So your questions will have to be answered simply yes or no and nod of the head. Okay, we got you. We only have a few questions, and we want to know if she can identify the man who beat her from these pictures we've got here. All right, Sergeant. This way, please. Thank you. Sally. Sally, these gentlemen are from the police department. They'd like to ask you a few questions. Uh, uh, now, there's no need to be nervous or afraid. Just simply nod your head yes or no. Oh, that's fine. All right, Sergeant. Uh, Sally, did you see the man who attacked you? Yes. She says yes. Did you get a good look at his face? You did. All right, Sally, now you can answer these three together, just yes or no. Was he tall? Did he have dark hair? Did he have large hands? He did. Ben. All right, yeah, Jim. Hand me the folder. Yeah, yeah. Here you are. Thanks. Now, there's just one more thing, Sally. I'm going to show you some pictures now. Take all the time you want before you make up your mind about each one. If you recognize any one of these men as the person who attacked you, just nod your head, all right? All right, it's fine. Very good. Here's the first one. No? All right. Here's the next one. No. Uh, how about this one? No? All right. Here's another. Do you recognize him? <laughs> this was the man? Are you sure, Sally? Thank you. That's all. Let's go. Did you uh, find what you wanted, Sergeant? Yes, Doctor, we did. Here. It's this one. Hmm. Nice looking chap. Who is he, Sergeant? His name's Savage, Dr. Froman. Johnny Savage. When we got back to the office, we checked in with Ed Backstrand. In five minutes, an all-points bulletin and a full description of the suspect was broadcast to every radio car, every motorcycle officer, to every sheriff and law enforcement agency in Los Angeles and Southern California. By nightfall, a manhunt was on. More than a dozen extra patrol units were called in for duty that night. And when they pulled out of the police garage, the name, the picture, and the full description of Johnny Savage was in the possession of every officer. The same for the patrolmen. Whether they walked a beat downtown or out in the residential areas, the picture of Johnny Savage went with them. Everything was done that could be done. On the second night of the manhunt far out on the edge of town, Johnny Savage, the red light bandit, got his 12th victim, a 63-year-old storekeeper. Attention, all units. 939 Markham Street, near Clark... 211 and slugging, code 3, ambulance dispatched. All units, 939 Markham Street, Clark. Here it is, Skipper. Tie in. What'd you get? 
Wilkerson lifted the prints off that black sedan at Ram Joe and me. Yeah? They belong to Johnny Savage. Yeah, good. That storekeeper last night is a Savage, all right. The victim identified him from his mug. All right. We got enough of this Savage guy to put him on ice for life. All we have to do now is to get him. Now, look, the way we figure it, Ed, this red light bandit is using stolen cars with coal plates, so there's no way of tracking down the cars at regular commercial garages. He's got to be running private garages someplace around town. All right, let's get the neighborhood patrolman on the job. Advertise it. All over town. It's a city ordinance, isn't it? People who rent private garages are bound by law to register the car and license number with the police. Start a campaign if you want, but find those cars. Right. Yeah, wait a minute. Hello, Backstrand. Yeah? When? I see. Yeah, thanks. What is it, Ed? It was the hospital. About the girl, Sally. Sally Wilder? What about her? She died five minutes ago. That night, everybody went back on the job as usual. The cruiser cars, the patrolmen, the motorcycle officers, and about a dozen decoy cars. Armed police women riding alone in cars or parked in lonely spots with a police officer escort. Our car, 80K, was still in the garage for repairs, so they assigned us another one. And we started to make the rounds. Everything was usual. Except one thing. We weren't tracking down just a thief anymore or a sadist who liked to beat people's faces in. We were out to get a murderer. It was a perfect night for the suspect. Dark, no moon. I gave Ben two to one odds and I put up five dollars that we'd get Savage that night. I lost the five dollars. We cruised until seven the next morning. But there wasn't even a nibble. We had breakfast at the Federal Cafe, a little restaurant down the street from the city hall, and it was about 8.15 when we got back to the office. We were pretty tired. Robert Detail, Romero. I would like to speak to Sergeant Friday. Just a minute. It's for you, Joe. Okay, thanks. Friday talking. Sergeant Friday, I want to talk to you. Well, I'm listening. Go ahead. I mean, I want to talk to you in person as soon as possible. Can't you tell me over the phone? What is it? I cannot tell you over the phone. It is very important. Can you come now? Well, now, look, mister, I'm awful sorry, but we're very busy down... 554 Ramona Avenue. Can you come now? Well, what's this all about? Who is this speaking? My name is Carl Savage. My son's name is John. Here it is, Joe. Neat-looking little place. Yeah. Yeah? I'm Sergeant Friday. You Mr. Savage? Yeah, come in. Okay. This is my partner, Sergeant Romero. How do you do? I will be brief, gentlemen. I am the father of John Savage. I wish for you to catch him. I, I will help the, you. I noticed the name on the mailbox outside, Mr. Savage. You changed your name lately? I changed my name ten years ago when John first got into trouble. My own name I had to change. The shame. Always from him, my son. Shame. Mr. Savage, has your son been home since he got out of prison? Yeah, many times, to ask for money. I would not give him any, so he struck me. Last night, I read in the newspaper, the little girl he beat up. She is dead. Then I make up my mind. Do you know where your son is now, Mr. Savage? Not now, no. But our garage has a car in there. It is not his, I know. Also in the garage... I find many license plates. I find spotlights with red glass lens. But you don't have any idea where we could find him. No, but he will come back. He always comes back for money. We're going to station an officer here in the house, Mr. Savage. Anything you want, if it will catch him. He's bad, Sergeant. Like something poison. All, all true, he's bad. See a sewing basket over him, Mr. Savage? The wife live here with you? Ten days ago, before this starts, I bury Gertrude... My wife, his mother. Sergeant, for ten years she is sick, but for ten years she stays alive to see him from prison. Ten days ago, she died. He did not even come to the funeral. Does your son have any idea that you might call us? No, no, I don't think so. But when you catch him, give me a gun. With my own two hands, I will kill him. Johnny Savage. Before we left, we called Ed Backstrand and we brought him up to date. He sent three detectives out to relieve us, Davis, Griffin, and Marsh. We told them to keep an eye on the house and the stolen car in the garage. That night after dinner, Ed Backstrand, Ben and I went out and relieved them. We parked the cruiser car in the garage next door, and then we took up our posts. Carl Savage had a light supper, and then he went to bed about nine. The three of us sat at the front windows in the darkened house, and we waited. 
Ben kept his eye on the garage. Outside, across the city, the manhunt continued as usual. Three hours went by. The waiting got monotonous. Brandy, Mm -hmm. Romero, look alive, will you? Oh, yes, Skipper, I'm sorry. That clock's enough to put anybody to sleep. Uh, What time you got? 12.23 a.m. Thanks. The clock kept ticking. We were tired. We took turns keeping each other awake. At ten minutes past two, I looked at my watch, and then I settled back and tried to find some kind of a comfortable position. They started so faintly, it was just like the ticking of the clock. Same rhythm. And then they came closer, and the sounds got out of rhythm. Backstrand's head came up with a snap. Freddy, Romero, you hear that? Yeah, Ed. Get up to the window, watch the curtains. You see anything? Yeah. Yeah, somebody's coming. Savage? Can't tell. Wait a minute, he's slowing down. He's going up the driveway to the garage. He's going inside. That's him. Come on. Watch it, he spotted us. He went over that fence into the yard. There he is, Friday. You hit him, Joe. Maybe. Yeah, he's going for the street. He's headed for that car, Ed, that sedan up on the corner there. Yeah, Romero, go back and get the car. Right, Skipper. Yeah. Must have parked up the block before he came around. Where's Romero? I don't know. Oh, here he comes now. All right, let's go. Get that radio on, Joe. It's already on, Ed. All right, give him a call. Any sign yet? No, nothing so far. Next corner to the right, Ben. Unit 80K to control four. 80K to control four. Clear and keep frequency four open. This is an emergency. EDK, Roger. Frequency four, open and clear. Attention, all units on frequency four. Stand by. EDK, go ahead. Yeah, there he is, Friday, up ahead. Dark blue sedan. Control four. We are in pursuit of the possible red light bandit. Suspect is driving a dark blue 1949 sedan. License number in the seven column. 61 Robert, 784. Use caution. Suspect is armed. Code 3. Attention, all units. Attention, all units. Unit 80K now pursuing possible red light bandit. Suspect is driving a dark blue 1949 sedan. License number in the 7 column. 61 Robert 784. Use caution. Suspect is armed. Code 3. Your location, 80K. Control 4. We are headed east on Wilshire Boulevard, crossing La Brea. Attention, all units. Suspect is headed east. Watch it, Romero. Don't lose him. I see him, Skipper. Control 4. Still pursuing red light bandit. Headed east on Wilshire. Now crossing Rossmore. Attention, all units. Suspect is still headed east on Wilshire. Now crossing Rossmore. Suspect is armed. Use caution. Code 3. That truck pulling out up ahead. Hit the siren, will you, Skipper? Yeah. Right, hold on to tight squeeze. Getting on, Romero. Out of traffic up ahead. He's got to slow down. Control 4. Suspect headed east on Wilshire, crossing Western Avenue, closing in. There he goes. To go right down Sherman Alley. It's a dead end. Yeah. Control 4. Suspect turns south into Sherman Alley, closing in on suspect. Attention, all units. Suspect has turned south into Sherman Alley. Suspect is trapped. Converge on Sherman Alley. There he is, Skipper. Pulling up ahead. He's jumping out. All right, take the mic, will you, Ed? Here. Come on, Ben. I'll direct the other cars in. If you need help, holler. All right, Skipper. All right, which way to go, Ben? Down between those buildings. Come on. He's starting up the back fire escape. All right, keep him busy. All right, Savage, come on down. He wants to go the rough way. One more chance, Savage. Come on down. No use, Joe. He's heading up for the roof. Come on. Huh. He climbs like a monkey. Come on, let's get him. Yeah, right. Here, I'll give you a hand. Here, here's the rope. Where'd he go? I don't know. Let's spread out. All right, Savage, you're through. Throw your gun out and come out with your hands up. Watch it, Joe. He's running for the edge. He's going to jump. I'll get him. All right, up. Oh, guy back here. Where you lousy cop? Where you dirty lousy cop? I'll kill you, man. You're through, Savage. You're through. Good, Joe. Yeah. Throw the cuffs on, will you? Yeah, you just betcha. Yeah. Yeah. You want a smoke? Yeah, I can sure use a one. Thanks. Hmm. Quiet up here. 
Yeah. I was just thinking. Well? Carl Savage, this guy's father. Mm Mm-hmm. What about him? Nothing. What would you do, Ben, if your son was a murderer? The story you have just heard is true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. John Savage was tried and convicted of murder in the first degree. He was executed in the lethal gas chamber at the state penitentiary. You have just heard the sixth in a new series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet is furnished by the Los Angeles Police Department. Tonight's program is dedicated to Patrol Officer Robert Steele of the Montana State Highway Patrol, who on the morning of November 2nd, 1947, gave his life so that yours might be more secure. Dragnet came to you from Los Angeles. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. October afternoon, Nat's bar, a little place, is almost empty. Almost, not quite. And how is my very good friend Nat today? Yes, Mr. Boynum. This being an especially fine afternoon, and I having just acquired two lovely bottles, which you will perceive in this paper bag at my elbow, I have decided to ask for your hand in marriage. Look, Mr. Boynum, if that is to be your attitude, Nat, I shall have to drown my sorrows in a jigger of rye. Just one, that's all. Sorry, Mr. Boynum. No credit. Today in that, you'll be glad to know we can barter on a cash basis. You see? Legal tender. One straight ride. That was the idea. Okay, it's your funeral. First one always tastes rotten, don't it? Or maybe you never like the taste. Again. Say, uh, how about your brother? You told me you and him was going away for the weekend. Uh, we were, and in fact we are. On the 645. <laughs> Unfortunately, most unfortunately, my brother Wick was called away by a business matter. <laughs> I just happened to remember a telephone call. Pretty sharp. And then you duck right out and spend your train fare for liquor, huh? Taking them two bottles with you? Oh, I may never touch them while I'm there. Not a drop. What you don't understand, all of you, is that I've got to know what's around. That I can have it if I need it, that's all. Yeah, I know a lot of guys like that. Take a bottle and put it on the shelf. All they want is just to look at it. Won't even have a corkscrew, just to be sure. Only all of a sudden, they grab the bottle and bite off the neck. Matt, one more reproving word, and I shall consult our lawyer about a divorce. Let me wipe up the bar. That glass left a circle. No, no. No, don't wipe it away, Nat. Let me have my little vicious circle. You know, the circle is the perfect geometric figure. No end, no beginning. Weave me another, Nat. Oh, come on, Nat. One little jigger of dreams. Nope. You don't approve of drinking? Not the way you drink. You're worried about me, huh? Well, don't be, Nat. Just just think what it does to my mind. It tosses the sandbags overboard so the balloon can soar. Suddenly, I'm competent, supremely competent. I'm one of the great ones. I'm Michelangelo molding the beard of Moses. I'm Van Gogh painting pure sunlight. I'm Barrymore before the movie's got him by the throat. I'm a hold-up man. I'm Jesse James' brothers. I'm all three of them. I'm W. Shakespeare. And out there, it's not Third Avenue any longer. It's the Nile, Nat. The Nile. And down it moves the barge of Cleopatra. Listen. Purple the sails, and so perfumed that the winds were lovesick with them. The oars were silver, which to the tune of lutes kept stroke, and made the water which they beat follow back.
suddenly and realize it's late. Now grab your bottles and hurry home, but don't go in yet, Don. Look up there first. Look up. All your windows dark. But must have gone. Sure, he'd be mad enough to go away alone. But Helen, Helen may be around. Watch out, she doesn't see you sneaking in. All right, you're in. Now lock the door. Slip the catch. So far, so good. No, no, wait a minute. Those bottles, they've got the high one down. That's it, that's right. In the ceiling light, in the metal ball. Now sit the other bottle by the chair and pull out that cord. And fill the glass. Nothing to stop you anymore, Don. Go on and drink. Drink. No one can see you. It's grown quite dark. Any light at all. Mr. Burnham, I thought you was going away. I have the usual. Look, Mr. Burnham, this is still morning. Go ahead, Matt. Okay. It's when you need it most in the morning. Haven't you learned that yet? At night it's a drink, in the morning it's medicine. I'll have another jigger of tonic. How about those two quarts? Did you polish off both them bottles last night? Both? Hey, that's right. I did have two bottles, didn't I? I hid one of them. I've still got it. I'm a capitalist, Ned. I got untapped reserves. I'm rich. Mr. Burnham, <laughs> if you had enough money, you'd kill yourself in a month. Don't make no difference to me. But it sure is tough on that girl. What girl? The one in the leopard coat. She was in again last night, looking for you. That's an awful high-class young lady. You bet she is. How the heck she ever get mixed up with a guy that sops it up like you do? Yeah, it's a problem, isn't it? That nice young man who drinks and a high-class young lady, and why does he drink and why doesn't he stop? That's my novel, Matt. Morbid stuff. Nothing but the book of the month. Club, a horror story. The confessions of a booze addict. The luck book of an alcoholic. Oh, come on. That breakdown. I'm empty again. You know what I'm going to call my novel? The Bottle. That's all. Very simple. The Bottle. Get it all in my mind. Let me tell you the first chapter. The man with the bottle meets a girl, extra special girl. He meets her, makes a date, goes on the wagon for six weeks. He's in love, huh? That's what's gonna be so hard to write. Love is the hardest thing in the world to write about. So simple. You've gotta catch it through details. The early morning sunlight hitting the ash cans in front of our house. A ringing telephone that sounds like Beethoven's pastoral. A letter scribbled on our office stationery that smells like all the lilacs in Ohio. And no drinking? He thinks he's cured. If he can find a job now, they can be married, and that's that. But it isn't that. Not quite, because... Fill me up, and I don't tell you why. You see, it's a few months later now, and she's written the folks all about the fellow. They've come all the way from Ohio to meet him. He's supposed to be at the hotel at noon. But suddenly he's scared. He knows he can't face him. Not like that, not cold. He needs a drink, just one. And so he takes just one. And then another, and then another. And then all of a sudden it's five o'clock and he's still there at home with his bottle. He's drunk. He's blind. And when the girl comes up to find out what's happened, that's how she finds it. Don, I understand. Of course I do. You were a little nervous about meeting my folks, so you took a few drinks. What of it? Most people drink a little. Sure. The lucky ones who can take it or leave it. But then there are the ones who can't take it and can't leave it either. Helen, what I'm trying to say is I'm not a... Drinker, I'm a drunk. Darling, we can go over this tomorrow. Right now. You've heard the facts. That's all there is to it. I've heard them, and they're not very pleasant. But they could be worse. After all, you're not an embezzler or a murderer. You can be cured. That has a familiar ring to it. There must be some reason why you drink. The right doctor can... I'm way ahead of the right doctor. I know the reason. The reason is me, what I am. Or rather, what I'm not. What aren't the... What aren't you that you want to be, Don? A writer. Silly, isn't it? Because I could be. I was. Until that guy started looking over my shoulder and whispering in a thin, clear voice like the E string on a violin. Don Burnham, he'd whisper. It's not good enough. How about a couple of drinks just to put it on his feet, huh? So I had a couple. That made all the difference. Suddenly, I could see the whole thing, the tragic sweep of the great novel, beautifully proportioned. But before I could grab it and throw it out on paper, the drink would wear off and everything would be gone. And there was despair. And a drink to counterbalance despair. One to counterbalance the counterbalance, that guy would be always at my shoulder. What guy? Who are you talking about? The other, Don Burnham. 
for the two of us, you know. Don the rider and Don the drunk. I try to break away from the other one a lot of ways. Once I even hocked my typewriter and bought a gun. <laughs> yeah, still got the bullets. Don! I meant to do it on my 30th birthday, but that other Don wanted us to have a drink first. He always does. The gun went for three quarts of whiskey. The flop suicide of a flop rider. But you are a rider. You have every quality for it. Wit, imagination, pity. Oh, come on. Let's face reality. I'm 33. I've never done anything. I'm not doing anything. I never will do anything. Zero, zero, zero. But you will. We'll straighten all this out. Helen, for your own good, you'd better go. Sit down. I'm going to make some coffee. Go on. Clear out. Clear out while you can. Because I've got a rival? Because you think you're in love with a bottle? You don't know me, Don. I'm going to fight and fight and fight. And don't try and argue. Bend down and be kissed. That was three years ago, Matt. That's a long time to keep fighting, to keep believing. The sanatorium, the health farm, the psychiatrist, nothing worked. And still she holds on. She knows she's clutching a razor, but she won't let go. Three years of it. Yeah, and how does it come out? I don't know. I haven't figured that far. Want me to tell you? Well, one day your guy gets wise to himself and gets back that gun. Or if he's only got a dollar ten, he goes up to the top of the Empire State Building, way up on top, and then... Or he can do it for a nickel in the subway under a train like that. But what if Helen's right after all? He sits down and turns out something good, but good, and that pulls him up and snaps him out of it. This guy? Not from where I sit. Oh, you're wrong, Nat. I'm going to do it. That's why I didn't go on that weekend. See, this time I've got it, Nat. I'm going home. I'm going to write. <laughs> Second act of The Lost Weekend, starring Ray Milland, Jane Wyman, and Frank Phelan, will follow in just a moment. Mm -mm. The San Francisco atmosphere. Superb service. What more could there be? At Frisco's own place, there's a whole lot more. From the complete menu, ribs to wings, and steak to hamburger. And it's also the home of Saturday and Sunday jazz in the Golden Horseshoe. Frisco's Old Place, fully licensed, great food and jazz. Saturday, 1.30 p.m. till 5.30 p.m. And Sunday from 1 p.m. to 7 p.m. Frisco's Old Place, 760 Brand Street, Burlington, in the Burlington Square. What more could you want? If you can't make it to Frisco's, listen to Saturday Night Special, James for Jazz Presentation, Norm Bernard and his band, on tape from that afternoon. weekend. The Burnham apartment. The living room. The portable typewriter on the desk. Two shaking hands slip a sheet of paper in the machine and slowly, grimly begin to type. The bottle. A novel by Don Burnham. For Helen, with all my love. With all my love. All right, Don.
stop it, Helen. Stop it, stop it, I'm all right. I just can't stop, stop it! Sure, Don, sure you're all right. All you need is a drink. One drink this morning, you'll be fine all day. Tough luck, though, bottle's empty. Any money? Not a dime. Nat got it yesterday. No credit either, no nothing. Unless you want to use that portable. Why not? Why don't you, Don? Why don't you give it to Ned? Why don't you get some good out of it? Now you're talking. Rip the paper out. Slap on the lid and let's get going. Sure, I know you're weak and the thing's heavy. But it's only to Ness. Just a block and a half. Come on, start walking. You need the drink, boy. Ned. Ned. Mr. Boynum, what's the matter? Let me have one, Ned. I'm dying. Just one, please. I thought you were home right in that book. Oh, he tricked me. The same old dirty trick. Give me one, Ned. I'll pay you when I can. I just, just don't let me die here. No credit, and you know it. All right, so it's charity. I'm begging for you, one, Ned. Just, just give me one. Yeah, one. One's too many, and a hundred's not enough. Here. Ned. That's all. Oh, please, please. I'll pay you. I'll let you have my typewriter. I'm no writer. You're the writer. Now go on home. Go home. And you better take something to quiet yourself. You're heading straight for the DT. I'm not, I'm not. That's what they all say, until they start seeing the little animal. Oh, shut up! You know that stuff about pink elephants? That's the bunk. It's the little animals. Little tiny turkeys in straw hats. Midget monkeys coming through the keyholes. With one guy, I know it used to be beetles. Oh, beetles crawling all over them in the dark. That's when it comes, you know, in the dark. Oh, stop it, stop it! Ned, please, please, just one. I'll die if you don't. You'll die if I do. Here, five bucks. But drink it up somewhere else. I don't want that kind of money here. Downstairs phoned me. She promised she'd let me know when you came home. She heard you scream. Go away. Go away. Oh, silly, I came to help you. Come on, now get up. Put your hand on my shoulder. No, wait, we need some light. No, Helen, no. What's wrong, Doc? The wall, don't look. What wall? There, over there, the mouse in the bat, that hole in the wall. There isn't any hole in the wall, no. But I saw it, I saw it. I saw... You had some kind of nightmare. Stop shaking, John. Everything will be all right. I'll stay right with you. You'll get some food and sleep. Little animals. It's always the little animals. That's what he said. That's what he said. But you're not making much sense. What he said about the ending. It's like this. Or like that. Like this. Or like that. Darling, what you need is a good night's sleep. We're more than ready for spring. What is your car? Is it longing for a lube job, ailing for lack of alignment, itching for an ignition tune-up? King Car Service Center is the spring tonic for your car. 
call King Car and arrange for a checkup to give your car the pep it lacks. You're ready for spring. Make sure your car is. King Car Service Center. Five certified mechanics and guaranteed workmanship. 185 Cross Avenue in Oakville, 842-5333. <laughs> Come on, Lazy Bones, it's time to get up. I've got toast and coffee and scrambled eggs and... Don! Don, did you hear me? Don! Don, why don't you... Gone. He's not here, he's gone. Yeah? Oh, good morning, miss. Excuse me. Did someone come in here this morning to pawn... Yes, there it is, on the rack. That leopard coat. Huh? I want it back. It's mine. It's your coat. It's all right. He had my permission. How much did you give him? He didn't want any money. He wanted to swap it. For what? Something he hawked here a long time back. What? A gun. Don. Helen, how the devil did you get in? I got the pass key from the janitor. The safety latch wasn't on. What's the matter? Why are you looking about this way? No reason. I, I just wanted to be sure I left everything right. Well, I'd, I'd like to finish up a few things before Wick gets back. You'd better run along. And thank you. Don, there was some whiskey left when I cleaned up last night. Was there? Would you like to know where I put the bottle? No. Don't you want a drink, Don? No. It's right here in the umbrella stand. Why don't you, Don? I don't feel like a drink. Not now, I told you. Just one. Here's a glass, please. Say, what are you up to? Drink it. You need it, Don. I want you to drink it. I'll get you some more. I'll get you all you want. What kind of talk is that? I will. I mean it. I'd rather have you drunk than dead. Dead? Who wants to be dead? Don't lie to me. You have a gun and bullets. If those bullets aren't in this drawer... All right, they're not there. So what? This business is just a formality. Don Burnham is dead already. He died over this weekend. That's not true. It is. He died of moral anemia, of fear, of shame, of DTs. That Don Burnham. And now you want to kill the other one? What other one? There were two Dons. You told me so yourself. Don Burnham the drunk and Don Burnham the rider. It's just the drunk who died, so the rider's free. No one to whisper anymore. No one to interfere. Oh, stop trying to storm me. It's too late, Helen. What do you expect, a miracle? Yes. Yes, yes, if I could only make you wait. Who is it? It's me, Mr. Boynum. I got something for you. Come in, Nat. What is it? The other night at my place, you forgot your typewriter. Thought I'd bring it up. Thank you, Nat. Writes real good. I oiled her up a little. I didn't oil her up so you could hock it. I'll take it, Nat. Oh, sure. Well, goodbye, Mr. Burnham. And, uh, how's all them lilacs in Ohio? <laughs> Don, this is it. It happened. I didn't ask for a big miracle. Helen, you're not serious. Somebody is. Somebody somewhere sent this typewriter to you. Why? Because he means you to write. Write what? I tried. Couldn't even find the first line. Of course you couldn't. You couldn't write the beginning when you didn't know the ending. The end is a question mark, Helen. Will be as long as I live. Don't say that, Don. Give me a Helen. That glass, I'll take it now. Don. Don, you dropped your cigarette in that... Yes, Helen. There's a question mark after every story. Love. Will it last? Success. Does it bring happiness? Death. Is it heaven or hell or sleep? All right, this strength of mine, such as it is, will it hold out? We'll try. of the Motion Picture Relief Fund, thank you, Ray Milland, Jane Wyman, and Frank Phelan for your deeply moving performances. Which bring us quite fittingly to the Red Book Magazine Awards for 1945. As you all know, Red Book Magazine annually awards the Red Book Cup for what it deems the outstanding screen achievement of the year. And it is Lady Esther's annual custom to invite one of the previous year's winning cast 
to make the presentation on behalf of Red Book. Last year's winner, of course, was Going My Way. And here in person is Barry Fitzgerald. Thank you very much. Well, I've just this to say. This is a beautiful cup, and Leo McCary, Bing Crosby, and I have valued having it for a year. Now it goes into other hands. And I'm sure that millions of people all over America will agree with Mr. Edwin Barmer, editor of Red Book, and Mr. Thornton Delahanty, its motion picture critic, that the cup is going to the proper people, the men behind the lost weekend. Jane, call the boys. Come on, Charlie. Come on, Billy. Go ahead, Ray. Introduce them. Ladies and gentlemen, our two-in-one boss, who between them wrote, produced, and directed the picture, Mr. Charles Brackett and Mr. Billy Wilder. Ladies and gentlemen, this is an honor indeed. In accepting it, Mr. Wilder and I want to thank the people who made the picture possible. Charles Jackson for his brilliant novel, the Paramount front office for giving us the green light, you, Ray, and you, Jane, and the whole cast, John Seitz, the cameraman, Don Harrison, the, e the editor, Miklas Rochard for his magnificent music. Billy, is there anyone I've forgotten? Ah, yes, a word of thanks to the man who helped us with our research, to Mr. W. C. Fields, for graciously permitting us to peek at the x-rays of his kidney. Now, <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait a minute, Willie. Let's be serious. Uh, speaking for all who worked in it, let me say that we are proud that a story like The Lost Weekend should ever have been brought to the screen. We think it marks a forward step towards Hollywood's real coming of age. And if the screen can approach all human problems with this same sort of frankness, this same sympathy, and this same desire to help, then Hollywood will have justified its place and its importance in our lives. And that's about all except for all of us. Thanks to Red Book, thanks to Lady Esther, and good night. <laughs>